Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 319 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Friday. Friday, 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 February 16th, 2024. And it's a bit of a cooler day here at the Beaver Lodge. We had some snow last night. So uh, again, the ground is white rather than green, which is nice. Because, <laughs> yeah, green in February is a little disconcerting. It just is. doesn't work with the brain. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, so enjoying uh, the snow. It was a nice little winter wonderland yesterday as it was falling. And because I had the night off theater, I got to take my sweetie out for Valentine's Day. He decided he wanted Indian food. So we went out to a lovely restaurant called Namaste here in Kingston. If you're ever in town, I do highly recommend it. And um, in true style, because of the weather, um, I made sure that we had the restaurant to ourselves. Very romantic. (laughs) I did that. (laughs) I arranged it. I arranged it. Oh, really? No, no, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> you know, when somebody like buys out the whole restaurant, it was like, oh, how romantic. We just all happened to walk in. Everybody was taken out or ordering out yesterday. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to drive in the snow. So, but we did have the restaurant to ourselves and we had a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, dinner and a uh, lovely Valentine's Day. So um, I'm feeling the love today. Nice. Yes. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Peppermaster, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. As you can hear, my good friend Mr. Grizzly is with me. And Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today? Uh, I think it's good. <laughs> I'm All not right. awake. When you decide, let me know. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm really not awake yet. I'm just, I'm a zombie. I'm just on my first cup of coffee. I just made a fresh pot, so... Hopefully, by the time we uh, get rolling, I'll be uh, alert enough to be somewhat human. <laughs> All right. As Kit Vim says, Bon matin, mes chers amis. Yes, good morning, and good morning to the best damn fam and all the podcasting registered trademark. Kit Tabby G, Kit Vim, Kit Cassie, Kit James. Oh, and you have some good news. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you're going to get some time with the kids. Let's see who else do we have. Kit PNC Bio. Kit Jen. Hey, how are you, darling? It's been a long time. It's nice to see you. Kit Cassie. Kit Elaine. Kit Jillian. Kit Toronto Dan. Kit Linda M. The original and the best. Lovely to see you. Let's see who else do we have. Kit Angela. Lovely. Hello, my dear. And going down the list. Is that everyone today? So far? Oh, no. Kit Mike H. Hello. He's always quiet. He says hello, and then all of a sudden I notice he's there. Kit Wishful, hey. By the way, thank you, Kit Wishful. 
We got a very, very nice tip yesterday. So thank you so much. Uh, who else do we have on here? That's it that so far this morning. So welcome all. I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, Mr. Grizzly is having a sneeze there off camera at the moment. Well, a little dizzy now. Yes. I am going to, um, there's lots in the, in the news today, uh, but given that it's a Friday and we have more time, I'm going to try something today and I don't know if it'll work. Oh, okay. okay. But I will try something. Um, bef but before we do that, um, we have a couple of Canadians to celebrate because we have some more world champions. At the World Aquatics Championships, a gentleman named Finley Knox was in third place after the first three legs of the 200 IM and then set a blistering pace of under 28 seconds for the freestyle leg to become world champion. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, now, there's one thing about this World Aquatics Championships because I kept on wondering, you know, where's Summer and where's Penny? And it seems that a lot of people uh, maybe have skipped it for their preparation for the Olympics or because they've already qualified, which then leaves more room for members to qualify. Yeah, and sometimes it'd be like a coaching decision for something like that. Coaching decision. Um, but still, world champion, because I was watching, I was wondering where Josh Leendo was in the one, men's 100, and he didn't compete compete this year. So that's how I was looking for to see how the men were doing. And then out of the blue, Finley Knox takes a gold. So there you go. And then Ingrid Welm, uh, became the first double medalist for Canada at uh, the championships, taking a bronze medal in the 50-meter backstroke as well. And while that was going on, in Calgary, the world's single-distance speed skating championships are taking place. And on the first day, Team Canada won gold in the men and women's team sprint event. So both sprint teams are world champions, and the Canadian men's team won by two thousandths of a second in a photo finish. That's what you call razor, razor thin. Really razor thin. And then uh, Elizabeth Weidman all brought home the silver in the women's 3,000 meters. So there you go. And uh, Isabel Weidman also, along with, um, I think it is... Valérie Malte, I might have her first name incorrect. Sorry, because there's some Maltese on the short track speed skating team as well. Um, but they finished the season on the World Cup season in first and second place oh, wow. for the um, mass start event. And Laurent Dubreuil finished the season in second place for the 500 meter. So all season long, our uh, long track speed skating team has been doing very well. And we still have two years before the Winter Olympics, so uh, they're, uh, if they can maintain this momentum, there's going to be a nice little haul when the Winter Olympics come along. So, congratulations to Canadians who are making us proud. Way to go. Hey, three world champions in one day. That's pretty kick-ass. Kind of rare. Mm. So, it's like the whole world's going Canada. Yes. <laughs> you know, someday Canada is going to take over the world and then you'll all be sorry. Like we are. <laughs> you'll, all, you'll all be sorry, eh? Eh? Ah, oh, man. Love it, love it, love it. And uh, for the kids who happen to be taking bets on the hair today because sometimes you wonder up, down, or bun. <clears throat> today I went for bun. So whoever picked bun... You win. But it's not a top. It's not a top. <laughs> not a top button. button. No. Back button today. <laughs> if you wear the top button, we, we can't speak for a couple of days because it's like, oh, come on, really? <laughs> I do sometimes wear the top button, but then sometimes it's like, yeah. Uh, but then it feels like I'm a game show buzzer. I just keep yeah, on waiting for something. Just, <laughs> you're just asking for the answer. Yeah. <laughs> you're, in, you're inviting the abuse. Uh, I wear the top button uh depending on how high I want the curls to start. Oh, so if yeah. I want them to start higher, I wear it. <laughs> uh, yes, Kid James, you did invent the Douglas hair over under and still have not yet won. But don't worry, you will. Keep playing. Is two ninety nine a minute? <laughs> <laughs> 
Two dollar ninety nine cents a minute. Six ninety nine for the first five minutes. Two ninety nine every minute after. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what to say about. That. <laughs> I watched too much late night TV when I was a teenager. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kiss and Cubs. There's lots of stuff in the news. Um, and maybe we'll touch on it if we have some time. But I really wanted to do something. Like I said, I haven't done before. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the federal court issued a decision on the constitutionality and um, I guess the reasonableness of the invocation of the Emergencies Act. And we touched on it, you know, for about 15 minutes during the show. And we gave you the broad outlines of it. Mm -hmm. But I did something I had never done before, and I actually decided to read a court decision beginning to end. And normally, when I go see a court decision, I just go to the end and look at the conclusions. And if there's something there that piques my interest, then I you know, scan through it right. to find something. Uh, but this one I actually read from beginning to end. Wow. So I really wanted to see what it was about. And while I was doing it, I think I thought, you know, like as well, I'll just take some nuggets out. You know, like sometimes when I comment a, a, a debate, when I live watch a debate and, you know, so, you know, they said this and they said this and this was wrong and all that kind of stuff. And um, so I thought I would do this for this decision. I thought, okay, you know, this will take me a couple of hours and, you know, that would be great. It did not take me a couple of hours. It took me four sessions of about four hours each. That sounds about right. Yeah. So uh, by the second one, I was kind of ruining my decision. By the end of the third one, I actually needed to take a week off <laughs> before I attempted to finish it. And then I said I should finish what I started. Uh, and then I thought, you know, ooh, I'm not sure if I'll ever do this again. But it was also a very, very, very educational experience. And I figured since I did the work, why let it go to waste? So I'm going to try and present what I found to you. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to translate because the reason why I'm saying that is because I've took a lot of snips mm -hmm. from the actual court decision and then was posting it uh, with them. So, um, I'm not sure how it's going to translate because I've never tried this before. However, if you would, uh, I'm putting it in the chat. Mr. Grizzly's there. If you happen to be watching on your computer, um, I'm putting a link to it on the Twitter. I call it a thread, but it's really a ball of yarn by the time I got done with it. Um, so you can follow along if you like that way. And, um, if you're watching and, uh, and if it's not working, uh, I'll I'll pull the ripcord on the shoot. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope it will work because how would I put it? The legal process is really fascinating, and when you hear the story in the news, you just heard you know it was ruled unconstitutional or the thing wasn't justified. And you get the broad outlines of why, but you don't really get how they got there. And then the telephone thing happens. One person starts telling it, and then you get the feel like, like the whole thing was unconstitutional. And it wasn't the whole thing. It was just certain parts. And for some very, very specific reasons, right? Because often when you think unconstitutional, you think, oh my God, they just like completely ran roughshod. And sometimes it's, just a mere technicality. It's something that could have been done better mm -hmm. rather than, you know, an outright attempt to steamroll over the rights of people. And in this case, there was a lot of that. And I thought that being well armed with the information might help people that end up having discussions or to actually figure out, you know, when they're saying our government is tyrannical. No, it really isn't in this case. So we're going to take an attempt at this. There were, um, how would I put it, App, what they're called applicants and respondents. 
in, in a case in, in legal terms. And I'm, I'm prefacing this that legal is not my background, so this is my best understanding, but I am not a lawyer. All right. So the respondent in this case was the Attorney General of Canada on behalf of the Government of Canada, and then there were applicants. First applicant was Canadian frontline nurses and Kristen Nagel. So they claimed that their rights were violated somehow, and they were trying to present their case. They managed to get standing, and they, they got to proceed to the court. Um, Judge Richard Mosley, I'll tell you right now, had no time for her. Okay. No time for her. Then we had the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, which is a group we would assume would be an applicant in this type of case because they you know, apply for these types of cases mm -hmm. all the time. This is what they do because they want to make sure that our civil liberties are being respected and that democracy is being respected at all times. And they're always, there are the nervous Nellies, right? Anything that the government does, they will probably oppose out of principle and, you know, try to push their argument to the extreme to really test it. And a lot of, they annoy a lot of people, but that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. Then there's the Canadian Constitution Foundation, similar, like this an upstanding organization, right? Then there are four other uh, citizens, Jeremiah Jost, Edward Cornell, Vincent Jersis, and Harold Ristow. And the judge had time for some of them and no time for some of them <laughs> as well. <laughs> and uh, I like this because, how would I put it? Throughout the decision, um, we tend to think of judges as dry and boring. And um, Federal Court Justice Richard Mosley um, has a little bit of sass going on under those robes, which made the decision a little bit fun to read. <laughs> now, a lot of these things are written in judicial speak, but it's a couple of times I do a judicial speak to English translation <laughs> for you. And uh, you see, this is what he's really saying here, but he can't say that because, you know, he's a judge. And he has to hold himself to a level and have some decorum or whatnot. But if you read in between the lines, so this was actually a fun read. So when we're talking about uh, Christine Nagel and uh, the Canadian Federation of Nurses, like right off the bat, the very first thing is, uh, in their application, Nagel and the CFN assert direct standing based on their participation in the Freedom Convoy 2022. It's unclear from the evidence how CFN participated other than through the person of Ms. Nagel. There's no evidence that any of the assertions made on behalf of the CSN in these proceedings result from resolutions of the membership or board of the organization or are anything other than expressions of Ms. Nagel's personal views. That was paragraph 13 of about a 300 and something paragraph decision right off the bat. A lot of writing involved right. in that. Holy crap. <laughs> Just a boom right off the bat. So basically this person said, I speak for this whole organization to try to make herself look bigger than she was. Mm -hmm. But apparently there's like the judges going, I don't know who you're speaking for. Nobody asked you to come here. Nobody asked <laughs> you to represent them. <laughs> there's, it's like, so basically she said, yo, you're grandstanding and, um, yeah, I'm bouncing you out on your butt pretty much. He talks about her more later because it didn't happen right at the beginning, but you know, the decision is not necessarily written in the order that things happen, mm -hmm. but he had no time for her. And there's a couple of more instances there that's going to happen. Now, Daniel Smith put out these, uh, tweets saying the court sides with Alberta. Yeah, not true. Alberta wasn't even an applicant in the case. Basically, Alberta was the cheese that stood alone because one of uh, some of the applicants had asked the attorney generals of the provinces to intervene in the case. So this is from paragraph 28. On March 14th, 2022, the Jost applicants filed and served an amended notice of constitutional question under Section 57 of the Federal Courts Act on each of the provincial attorneys general. Only the attorney general of Alberta responded to the notice. The Attorney General of Alberta also sought and was granted leave on May 5th, 2022 to intervene in the CCLA, Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and Canadian Constitutional Foundation files to make submissions on several non-constitutional questions. 
So they weren't even intervening on matters of constitution. Mm. They just showed up. They basically showed up with questions. So they were not prepared. But no interventions. They were not prepared. Like this. They basically showed up to grandstand. Again, of course. Say that we That's all they've got. Yep. Yeah. Now, the judge did describe the protest as a blockade that, quote, created intolerable conditions. Essentially, they subjected, quote, many residents and workers in the district, fellow citizens, to that which the OPP described as a threat to national security under oath. The judge decided this. So when they're saying it was peaceful, no. It was a blockade that created intolerable conditions. And they subjected many residents and workers in the area where the protest happened to a threat to national security. That was decided. Then the loudmouths like to claim ridiculous things such as 88% of donations came from Canadians. Notice the 88. Mm. HH. Yeah. Yeah. White power speak. Well, according to the judge, Justice Mosley's foundings, that's not so. Quote, donations to the fund, do donations to fund the protest were received by a crowdfunding site, Gibbs and Go. Information subsequently released indicated that 55.7% of the funds received totaling $3.6 billion U.S. were made by U.S.-based donors. So that which came from Gibbs and Go mm -hmm. was majorly foreign funded. This is not a secret or a surprise. We've known this all along. Yes, but now it's a federal court. Finding. Right. Now it's, now it's in the record as uh, official record. Yes. So when everything was added up, mm -hmm. more than half the money that came through Gibbs and Go came from foreign places and it's from the united states well and, and let's remember this uh, this is something important to remember how they went on and on and on about everybody supports us everybody loves us everybody wants us to do this no no the majority of your support was from foreign nationals not canadians it's documented we have it on record officially in the courts uh, and this is a good question from PNC Bio. How much was Russian? I don't know. Uh, a lot of that money was filtered and funded through U.S. hedge funds and right-wing extremists, and so it, it's tough to say, you know. Yeah, indeed. And James says this correctly and succinctly. The right-wingers on this planet have a very strong network of cooperation and songbook singing. No, and and you're correct, James. It, foreign donations doesn't make it illegal. We weren't weren't even suggesting that, but we're what we are suggesting is that the support was not coming from this country. The vast majority of the support was not from Canadians. That's what we're saying. Yeah. So when they're pretty much so when they're saying you know they're making this claim that you know this was a grassroots movement. This and you know, all of Canada is behind us to justify that. It's not so. It's really, really not so. That's not what happened. That's not how it went down. And uh, now we have a federal court decision to uh, support that. And uh, what you were saying, Mr. Grizzly, reminds me of one of my favorite comics. Yes. That's or exactly editorial what cartoons. Was, yeah. That's I mean, exactly what I was thinking the whole time I was saying that. Everyone supports us. No. Honk, 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 honk. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, so there's like five, four people holding a sign that says everybody supports us with loud honking from, and then there's like a whole mass of Canadians with another sign going, no, they fucking don't. <laughs> <laughs> and turns out that was indeed the case here. The judge also ruled that, um, I don't know if these are big enough for people to see or clear enough. So that's why I haven't necessarily been putting them up. But maybe they are. I'm not sure. But that's now. That's not going to work. I, I don't want to show all those things. Uh, the, the justice ruled that extremism and threats to democracy were real. Mm -hmm. 
Paragraph 41. Information considered by the IRG according to its minutes included that extremist elements were taking part in the process. These included members of an organization known as Diagalon, which reportedly proposed to establish a diagonal country from Alaska to Florida under the slogan, Gun or Rope. The founder, Jeremy McKenzie, was arrested in January 2022 before coming to protest in Ottawa after police found firearms, prohibited magazines, ammunition, and body armor at his home. Moreover, one of McKenzie's associates, Derek Harrison, had made a video in which he reportedly expressed his desire to turn the Freedom Convoy protests into our own January 6th event. Alluding to the storming of the U.S. Capitol, one of the applicants, Miss Nagel, was in contact with McKenzie when she was in Ottawa. Paragraph 43. Visible symbols of hate were seen or to be held or worn by protesters in media photographs of the, op- applica- of the occupation. The applicants, Mr. Jost and Miss Nagel, acknowledged under cross-examination having seen demonstrators wearing yellow star of David emblems featuring the words non-vax. That is just... That did not make the press. I, I actually did see those photographs uh, okay, I a number of times, and every time I saw one, my blood was boiling. I'm like, you ignorant assholes. Mm-hmm. It, it, the historic uh, significance of, of what what that means and, and how they tried to co-opt it for their own movement, their own bowel movement, because it was a pile of shit. Yeah. Well, they keep it's on just, talking. It's about, disgusting. They keep on talking about Nuremberg all the time, right? So, wearing yellow stars of David emblems featuring the words non-vax in comparison to the symbols victims of the Holocaust were forced to wear. News articles reported protesters with flags featuring swastikas and signs bearing the Nazi SS symbol as well as Confederate flags. So, when they say, no, that wasn't the case, um, yeah, it was. The judge ruled. The current premier of Alberta was singing a quite different tune from that which was the reality of the day. I just spilled coffee in my lap. <laughs> I'm very yeah. clumsy. It's only my first cup of the day. So we have Paris paragraph 46 here. On January 29th, 2022, a blockade began at the Sweetgrass Coots Alberta border crossing. On February 5th, 2022, the Minister of Municipal Affairs of Alberta wrote to the federal ministers occupying the portfolios of public safety and emergency preparedness, seeking federal assistance, including equipment and personnel to move about 70 trucks and semi-tractor trailers as well as approximately 75 personal and recreational vehicles. The Alberta minister noted that the RCMP had exhausted all local and regional options to alleviate the disruption. The Alberta government that is there. Yes. Asking questions. Just asking questions. Trying to make the case that something unconstitutional happened. Mm Mm-hmm. At the time, told the federal government that the RCMP had exhausted all local and regional options to alleviate the disruption. By February 11, 2022, between 200 and 250 additional convoy vehicles gathered at Milk River, 18 kilometers from Coots, where the police had set up a checkpoint to limit access to Coots, only about 40 vehicles remained at Coots itself. Then, It wasn't only the government of Alberta, right? But the government of Manitoba as well. Mm -hmm. Premier Heather Stephenson pleaded in a private letter to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to intervene at the Emerson border blockade just days before she publicly opposed his decision to enact the Federal Emergencies Act against protesters. That's from the Brandon Sun on February 16th, 2022. The judge took note of both those letters when coming to the decision. Now, for those who claim that Coots was handled way before the exact to make it seem like it wasn't an actor, that um, was not the case. according to the judge, it was mere hours prior to and only after every other signal had been sent that it was coming very soon. Paragraph 52. The full cabinet met on February 13th, 2022 to discuss the situation. The question of whether to invoke the Emergencies Act was then delegated to the Prime Minister. Paragraph 51. Early on February 14th, 2022, RCMP's officers executed a warrant and raided two camper trailers and a mobile home at Coots, 
arrested 11 individuals, and seized a cache of weapons, including 14 firearms, a large supply of ammunition, and body armor. Four individuals were charged with conspiracy to commit murder and other offenses. Some of the body armor seized was marked with the Diagalon insignia. Mm -hmm. That part I did not know. It was probably reported, but that part I did not know. Um, so on February 14th, by the way, and I'm sure this pissed off a lot of people because oh, a lot okay. of people were posting stuff saying, two years ago, the prime minister invoked tyranny on it. It's like, no, no, two years ago, the prime minister said a love letter to Canada. Mm -hmm. it says, you don't come into my country and take about 100,000 of my fellow citizens hostage. We're going to put an end to that shit. Yep. And remember, these people also tried to bring the entire economy to its knees and sought overthrow of a democratic elected government. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the protest. They also like to claim that the prime minister did this unilaterally. But the truth is the lieutenant governors and council of all the provinces were consulted. The measure was voted on in Parliament, and their debate in, and debate in the Senate had commenced. Now, debate in the Senate did not finish because the Prime Minister revoked the measures after about a couple of days. I think. Yeah, it was it was maybe five days, Max. It yeah, wasn't four or five long. days, um, and then they decided that it was moot to keep on discussing it in the Senate, given that uh, it wasn't still in action. Well, all the border. I think that was not border blockades decision. had been and yep. dismantled at that point. They had gotten everybody out of Ottawa. The city had returned to a somewhat state of normalcy. And I say somewhat because there were still blockades. And honest to goodness, if you were trying to walk from one area to another, there were police that would go, where are you going and what are you doing? That calmed down really quick. It, it, like it was, I think, immediately after everybody was cleared, that was the case. By day two, after everybody was cleared, there were police standing around, but they weren't asking everybody ever, anything for the most part, unless you were carrying a lot of stuff and looked suspicious and who determines what suspicious, suspicious is, I don't know. But uh, I would walk th throughout my neighborhood and I never got questioned. But then again, I am a cis hat, white, six foot two male in boots. So, yeah. Paragraph 57, subsection 58 one of the act requires that an explanation for the reasons for issuing the declaration and a report on any consultations with the lieutenant governors and council of the provinces with respect to the declaration shall be laid before each house of parliament within seven sitting days after the declaration is issued the section 58 explanation and the consultation report were tabled before each house on february 16th 2022 so invoked on the 14th and all reports about consultations with all the provincial potential sorry the provincial lieutenant governors and councils was tabled two days lieutenant. later lieutenant sorry it's okay i i always say lieutenant i know i know the Yankee. motion to <laughs> sorry the motion to confirm the proclamation was adopted in the house of commons on february 21st 2022 a motion to confirm the proclamation was then tabled in the senate and debate began in that chamber on february 22nd 2022 i think they should have finished the debate in the senate no matter what have seen the whole thing through with royal assent rather than pulling it back it might have been helpful ultimately in the end particularly when it came to this decision but maybe not cassie's comment here makes me chuckle we're tough we're gonna stay Ooh, cold <laughs> yes the fools at emerson blockade abandoned their vehicles and tractors because it was a blizzard and minus 40 didn't have the balls to stay for the cause <laughs> now we're not going anywhere Ooh, cold it's also important to remember that though Premier Doug Ford, Mr. Vanishing Cream, mm -hmm. did sweet fuck all to help, he did mm -hmm. declare a state of emergency for the province of Ontario. He and did. approved of the measures. And in a surprising plot twist, we mentioned it on the show, his government came out on January 24th still in support of the invocation mm -hmm. after the decision from the federal court was rendered. Said, no, no, we still support it. So conservatives disagree amongst themselves. Yes. And remember what the, what's a, vacation. one of the rulings from the judge, he said uh, recently in the recent statement that came out was the whole thing about, he, he felt it was too much of a heavy handed thing for the entire country. I'm like, but that's how the act is. I mean, it's not 
the Emergencies Act is not made for a specific area. Actually, it is. We're going to. Oh, it is? Yes. Oh, now I misunderstood then. Yes, that's why I'm saying there's lots of interesting stuff in this. Okay, so, so on, you can do a surgical strike. So like Ontario and Alberta could have been, and maybe Manitoba if it was needed instead of it across the country. It seems so, yes, because that was I part of that's part of the stuff that went into the decision. I did not understand it that way. Well, t yes. look, hey, TIL, today I learned. Exactly. So both uh, the Ontario State of Emergency and the federal invocation of the Emergencies Act measures were both revoked on February 23rd. Now, some of the reasons for which the measures pertaining to bank accounts might have been declared unconstitutional were raised by the judge at this point. We're at paragraph 96 here. Superintendent Baudouin, this is from the OPP, had an operational role in the implementation of the Emergencies Act measures. He was responsible for overseeing the use of the economic order and developed the process used by the RCMP for sharing information with financial institutions. The economic order did not specify the procedure under which financial services providers would identify individuals or entities that met the definition of, quote, designated person. Making it up as they went along, the RCMP developed a template for sharing information with the financial service providers about persons believed to be directly or indirectly involved in activities prohibited under the regulations. An example of that template is attached to this affidavit. Another is attached to Mr. Jersey's affidavit, which pertains to him. The RCMP did not generate the information, but received it from the OPP and OPS and facilitated its dissemination to financial institutions. The banks and other service providers would report back to the RCMP under Section 5 of the Economic Order or any steps that were taken with the information. In total, Superintendent Baudouin averred the RCMP disclosed information on approximately 57 entities and individuals to financial service providers and approximately 257 accounts were frozen. So 257 accounts held by 57 entities or individuals. It's so when you hear all these people online saying, my bank account frozen, my bank account was frozen, there's only 57 people. Wasn't it, uh, was it Mustafa or was it uh, Blaine? Or, or, or Brianne. Brianne, I think it was Brianne. Yes. Mm -hmm. On cross-examination, Superintendent Baudouin acknowledged that the RCMP officers involved in this process did not apply a standard such as reasonable grounds before sharing information with the financial institutions. So of all the things that never happened, this never happened the most? <laughs> Yes, right. but here's the thing. The judge is saying specifically that when it came time for the government, for police officers to tell banks, these are accounts we need you to look at or freeze. Before that happened, a common standard had not been developed and it was not applied consistently consistently this is a legitimate big concern that's a red flag that's something that should not happen that's something we should learn from from this because if ever this is needed again that powers need to be invoked again mm. it is very 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 important that criteria be established beforehand because this led directly to one of the things that led the judge to claim that a certain part of the measures were indeed unconstitutional. So I want you to put a pin in this one. So, 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 well, repeat that. I, I didn't, I wasn't following very well. Say that again, please. Cause I, I need to get it straight in my head, please. The fact of a lot, a lot the fact that there was a lack of a common standard mm -hmm. in determining what information would be sent to the banks to get the banks to give the RCMP personal information on the accounts and to freeze those accounts is something that was very, very key to the judge deciding that some of the measures invoked within the Emergencies Act were unconstitutional. Okay. So it doesn't mean that the government can't freeze bank accounts and that we can't have that disclosure of information but the manner in which it was done, and because there was no lack of a common, there was no common standard and no consistent application of it to everyone, created a situation where rights could be violated. So in other words, if they just clean that up, 
then the measures were constitutional. So something about freezing bank accounts that a lot of people might not be familiar with, and I, I can say that I intimately am, unfortunately, uh, familiar with, CRA can freeze your account at any given time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's happened to me in the past. When I was running my own company and I was having financial difficulties, uh, this was back in 20, 2009, post-2008, when the world was collapsing, uh, they froze my account. I had no access to money. Mm -hmm. And I was like literally freaking out. I'm like, what, how, what am I going to do? And I, I made a couple of phone calls and, and somebody said, here's what you do right away. Call them. And if they don't unfreeze your account within 48 hours, you need to open a new bank account somewhere as quickly as possible, because otherwise you're, you're screwed. Mm. CRA will freeze your accounts in a heartbeat. It happens to people all the time, but nobody mentioned how that's unconstitutional. I, I, I had no access to money, none, zero. So how was I going to eat? How was I going to pay my bills? They don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The judge then goes on, we're at about paragraph 100 now, to lay out the legal framework in which the Emergencies Act exists. And to be able to understand the decision, it's important to be familiar with that legal framework. So you don't look at the Emergencies Act alone in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You look at it where it fits within the overall context of the law. And then you need to look within it as to what constitutes a national emergency as defined in the act. So in order to do this, the judge makes a lot of statements and I won't quote here, but it boils down to, it's important to note that the Emergencies Act came, to effect into, came into effect in 1988 and had never once been invoked until the illegal blockade and occupation of 2022. Now, we have been very fortunate that that has been the case in Canada, that there's been no need, but there's been a downside to that. And the downside to this particular law not needing to be invoked for 34 years after it was passed is that the legally mandated review of how it works in application never had a chance to take place before 2022. Now, 1988 was pre-World Wide Web, though the TCP IP standard had started in 1983. It was pre-FinTrack. It was pre-cryptocurrency. It was pre-24-7 political rage farming. And it was pre-24-hour news networks in Canada. Right. Though CNN had, was launched in 1980, we didn't have CBC News Network or was News World at the time mm -hmm. until 1989. Well, there was no internet. There was no social media. There was no, you know, I mean, yeah. let, let, let me back that up though. There was actually an internet at the time. TCP IP had started. Correct. In 1983, but there was no World Wide Web that where we no. could all click, you know, Netscape had not been an IPO yet. Right. None of those things existed. Yes, there were people on bulletin boards who could communicate but it wasn't like it is today. Nothing at all like it is today. Not even close. There might have been, I don't know, out of a population of 6 billion at the time, I think, or whatever it was, there might have been half a million people that were connected outside of, of government and, and DARPA. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. what it is today. So this law was passed in 1988, and because it had never been invoked, sort of like became this forgotten law that nobody went and reviewed every five or 10 years or updated or whatnot. Nothing in the Emergencies Act since 90, 1988 was maintained in order to keep up with World Wide Web, FinTrack, cryptocurrency, 24-hour news, and 24-7 political rage farming. Yeah, it's something that needs to be revisited every X number of years. Kind of like... How Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the U.S. Constitution, he said we should revisit it every 20 years and adapt it to the changing times. But, you know, still right to bear arms. Yep. Now, <laughs> so there's been much debate prior and to since the vacation of the Emergencies Act about whether intentionally seeking to damage the economy via blockading or blocking cross-border trade and international financing of public actions, for example, can can be considered a threat to the security of Canada. 
Because again, without access to the web, without access to cryptocurrency, without access, that was not possible. Everything was through Western Union, right? <laughs> it's kind of hard to fund an occupation sending money cross border through Western Union. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not okay. easy. <laughs> so, but the government made the case that the attempt to kneecap, kneecap the economy did constitute a threat to the security of Canada. But is that in the definition of the act? as it is written, mm -hmm. because that's what the judge must judge upon. And this comment from James is absolutely true. What Stephen Harper did absolutely. during the G20 in downtown Toronto was far more egregious than what Trudeau did. Absolutely. By far. And that was, and that was re ruled also by the courts as being the largest one-day violation of Canadian human rights in our history. By far. And it resulted in a lot of legal settlements with a lot of money in compensation. See, this is the funny thing that all these folks who are supporting somebody like Pierre Polyev seem to ignore, is recent history. Mm -hmm. They only pay attention to the most recent history from two years ago. And I'm like, yeah, what, what, this, this was the biggest violation of Canadian, of, of human rights, charter rights, Canadians' rights in history in a single day. They were arresting people for looking sideways that day. Mm-hmm. So if you think, and it, and it, it was violent. Oh, it was, it, 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 you know, it was if violent. you think for well, one com, split com, second, compare and contrast with the dismantling of this occupation. If you think for one split second that Pierre Polyev wouldn't pull a stunt like that the first time somebody, you know, got upset about something, <laughs> boy, are you in for a surprise? Mm -hmm. So you have all these people that are saying we live in a tyrannical government. It's the most government, most corrupt government in Canadian history. Again. Compare and contrast the previous government of Stephen Harper pleaded guilty in court to in and out. Mm -hmm. They pleaded guilty to literally overspending to cheat to win the first election. They had a cabinet minister go to jail. Yes. Dean Del Mastro. They're the first parliament in all of the Commonwealth to ever been held in contempt by their own members. Ever. Yeah. Call me when something happens to this government, similar. Mm -hmm. This is not even, this is, every government has corruption, but this is by far not the most co corrupt government in Canadian history. Not even close. And it's certainly not tyrannical. We just have to look at the detail. We just have to look one government back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't even have to go that far. No. <laughs> right. I have a bunch of pictures so, here James sent me that I'll put on the screen from the... Um... G20. Yeah. G20? Yeah. I'll just scroll through them because there's so many of them. And you can see, you know, look at this. Well, there's there's a good example. Guys masked up with goggles on, ready to be pepper sprayed. Right? The amount of police. Yep. Look, look at this guy. You know, there's, 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 this was not a... This was hell. I remember watching this, and I was in Toronto when this took place at my sister's place. And we were watching it on TV going like, what the hell is going on? Oh, yeah. I was mortified when I was. Oh watching. yeah, it's like look at this. Look at okay, look at these police officers here. Yep. Riot shields, uh, face shields, uh, masks to stop for pepper spray, or tear gas or whatever. Like, <laughs> come on. It was a single day event. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Kid, Kid Dan, they used one of the movie studios as a makeshift jail. Mm -hmm. Kid James, I was kettled while taking those photos. Yeah, the so, kettling was a really, really bad thing. Oh, horrible. And, and you know, when people go on about how, well, what, what they did in, in Ottawa was unconstitutional. You mean when they took over my city and yep. shit in my streets for two weeks? Yeah, that was unconstitutional. Yeah, because they... At the G20, police were telling people to go in one direction. They were going one direction. Then they'd meet other police that would tell them to go in another direction. Mm -hmm. Then they were getting beaten. They're going, listen, I'm just trying to follow the goddamn orders. Yeah. Oh, you're right, James. It tell me two where days you want to go. I apologize. Two-day two event, day. Yeah. 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 So given the realities on the ground, it was inevitable that invocation of the act was going to cause concern for legal precedent and the risk of using a bad case to establish new law. That's why the work of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the Canadian Constitutional Foundation, is vital. I'm saying it here, even though they're pains in the asses, vital to good democracy. 
And it's good that they intervened here. Now, interesting side note here about Daniel Smith's claim that the court sides with Alberta, because I told you that uh, Alberta was not a litigant and was only there to ask questions and not actually take a position. So she was literally bullshitting. Well, here we go. Paragraph 120. The intervener, the Attorney General of Alberta, made submissions on five questions. I guess, and they literally, they're asking questions. They're not actually making statements. They're just saying, we would just like to know, what is the definition of national emergency in Section 3A of the Act requiring that it must be, quote, of such proportions or natures as to exceed the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it? What is the interpretation of the phrase in Section 3 of the Act cannot be effectively dealt with under any other law in Canada? What are the implications of the requirement in Section 17, I'm guessing subsection 2, paragraph C? I'm not sure what those mean in legal, legal terms, so I might be getting that wrong, I'm sorry. Of the Act, that the Declaration of Public Order Emergency specify the areas of Canada to which the effects of the emergency extend. Four, what is the interpretation of the requirement in Section 25, paragraph 1 of the Act to consult with the provinces? And five, what is the relationship between Sections 19.1 and Sections 19.3 of the Act? So they're literally asking the judge, we just want your answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. They weren't even there to make a claim. They just wanted that data, hoping that the judge would say something terrible, say say something that they could run with, and then say, see, look, big bad Canada. Look what they're doing to us again. But that was the extent of their intervention. So when when Daniel Smith says the court sides with Alberta, the court couldn't have sided with Alberta because Alberta didn't take a position mm-hmm. on anything. They were just there for clarifications. That was it. That's it. The premier of Alberta literally bullshitted. She lied to everyone. Wasn't was she in power at the time? I thought Jason Kenney was in power at the time. Jason Perry was a Jason Kenney was in power on the time, but after when the court decision came down. Oh right, okay. She okay. was representing it as a win for Alberta. Right. Alberta made no claim. Well, not to mention whatsoever. the fact that Alberta desperately asked for help from the federal government. They, they reached out for help. Yes, Jason yes. Kenny asked for federal help. Absolutely. And as I mentioned, stated in the letter to the government that it had exceeded the capacity of the RCMP. Mm. Right. And right now they're asking right here, because what is the interpretation of cannot be effectively dealt with and with under and uh, under Canadian law and of such proportions or nature as to exceed the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it when they themselves told the federal government that this has exceeded our capacity to deal with it? Now they're going back and they're batting their eyelashes. So what does that mean, really? Well, you <laughs> should know what it means because your former premier said that you had reached that point. Yeah, how convenient to forget that. Mm -hmm. Seems here that the applicant who was quickly tossed out on their behind, Nagel, was in this partially for the money, paragraph 138. Nagel, CFN, argued that they remain liable to prosecution for breaching the regulations. I do not accept this, (laughs) says the judge. So she's basically saying, Nagel is saying, well, they haven't charged me yet, but... You know, they still might, and I live in fear of that. So you you have to, like, give me more rights than everybody else, essentially, was her argument. Yeah. The judge did not accept this. As I discussed further below in relation to standing, the possibility of a prosecution against either Nagel or the CFN is entirely hypothetical given subsequent events and the passage of time. Moreover, their assertion of a potential claim for compensation for charter damages or under subsection 48, paragraph 1 of the Act, is speculative given the lack of evidence of any harm to Nagel or the CFN. And the result, I am satisfied that there is no live controversy between them and the respondent. (laughs) Oh! oh. Again, very, very nice words. But when a judge says, I am satisfied that there is no live controversy between them and the respondent. Ouch. That's a slap across the face. Oh, yeah. So basically, she's, he's saying, hey, I know you're standing here and making the case saying that uh, after you want this decision so you can take this decision and then go after the government and sue them for money. <laughs> On what grounds? Because no harm has been done to you. 
Yeah, well, you know. Well, they might still come and arrest me, and don't when do, they do, give me a call. Don't do illegal <laughs> things, and you should be okay. It's, it's been two years, honey. They haven't yet. So if they do, call me. Then we'll deal with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you'll stop living in fear. Yeah, exactly. That's a spanking. Now, here's something that made my ears prick up. The government argued this case could be shelved as likelihood of recurrence of another occupation was small. And if the Emergency Act ever needed to be reinvoked, the provision for a mandatory inquiry would still exist. So basically, the government made the case like, Judge, why are we doing this case? We should just throw this out. What are the odds that we're ever going to have to invoke the EAA again? And if we do, well, because we have that review that's mandated at any given, any Thing that happens will be picked up then. Uh, the judge said, nope. And uh, gave us a dose of reality. Paragraph 142. Under the, under the judicial economy analysis, courts can consider whether the matter is likely to recur and is evasive of review, and whether the matter is of national or public importance. The respondent does not dispute that the matter is of national and public importance, contends that alone is insufficient in the absence of additional social cost in leaving the matter undecided. The respondent suggests that the likelihood of recurrence is uncertain given the exceptional circumstances in which the act was invoked, and contend that further declarations will not be evasive of re- review going forward in light of the requirements for both a public inquiry and parliamentary review. Paragraph 143. I disagree. The risk of other episodes of public disorder of the nature which we occur, which occurred in February 2022 cannot be discounted. While the circumstances were exceptional up to that point in time, there can be no guarantee that there will not be a recurrence of similar events or worse in light of the rise of extremist elements within our society prepared to take their opposition to government policies to another level of protest and to whip up support for such protests through the extraordinary, extraordinary reach of social media. Mm. This is the judge saying this. I will repeat that because this did not get any press. While the circumstances were exceptional up to that point in time, there can be no guarantee that there will not be a recurrence of similar events or worse in light of the rise of extremist elements within our society prepared to take their opposition to government policies to another level of protest and to whip up support for such protests through the extraordinary reach of social media. That Mm. should send a shiver down your spine. Yeah. He's basically saying that this is a real and forevermore threat. Well, I can't disagree with him. He also accurately points out that the mandatory review is not a substitute for an actual judicial review. Paragraph 144. I agree with the applicants that neither the public inquiry nor the special joint committee of the House Commons and the Senate required by the Act to examine the declaration of emergency are substitutes for judicial review. Without dismissing in any way the importance of those procedures, their roles are not to adjudicate upon the legality and constitutionality of the measures adopted under the Act. Rather, their rules are to consider the events which took place and to make recommendations that, without legislative or other action, have no legal effect. While they are both important accountability mechanisms, they are legally and practically distinct from the court's adjudicative function. The judge ruled wisely. Well, judges in this country are not elected like... uh our neighbors have a thing where you can elect your district attorney, you can elect your judge, you can elect your sheriff, you can elect. It's not done like that here for good reason. Judges here ascend to that position through knowledge, experience, expertise, and years of legal practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to understand they know like, what they're doing. Yeah, in a court, each side is making their case, right? The government does not want a decision to go against it. Because, yeah, we, we need to dismiss this out of court. Like, we have other mechanisms to do this. And just mm-hmm. go, ah, 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 ah. That was definitely in our interest. Because mm-hmm. we may like that this government did it in this case. But we don't want to create a precedent that if you do this, oh, well, yeah, no. The mandated inquiry that happens after, that's enough. Mm. In case anything illegal actually or unconstitutional actually did happen. 
It's not a substitute. And then he offers a little dose of humility here, which is always a good thing. Paragraph 145, I am conscious of the reality that as a single post judge, and the post, I had to look it up because it's spelled P-U-I-S-N-E, and it basically just means judge of lower rank mm-hmm. in the hierarchy. I may err on the findings I make in these reasons. However, such errors can be cured on appellate review. Neither the commission nor the parliamentary committee process are susceptible to appeal, which is another reason why it had to absolutely go through court. There's no appeal process for the decision that Justice Rouleau gave us after the Public Order Emergency Commission. But there is one for court. Mm -hmm. In defense of democracy, this assessment by federal court justice on the potential for creating a bad legal precedent that could de facto give future governments carte blanche to violate the charter rights is 100% spot on. This is from paragraph 148. As argued by the Canadian Constitution Foundation, a public order emergency is a paradigmatic example of a matter that is evasive of review because it will almost always be over and moot by the time a challenge can be heard on the merits. That's a good question from James. Douglas, did you find the judge made contradictory statements that made it confusing for the public to understand his overall view? No, he did not. The okay. judge was actually very, very, very clear in his statements, applied humility where it was, but where um, the decisions can be contradictory is he's making this, he, he, it's like we said, for example, when we're talking the notwithstanding clause cases where a court will rule, so yes, this is unconstitutional, but then we'll say, what? Well, but the province invoked the not, notwithstanding clause and it does apply in this case, so our decision is moot. There's lots of things that he says, you know, were I in the government's shoes, I would have made the same decision, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess. And yes, this does constitute a national security threat, but I have to go by the word in the act. Right. So he's given his decision or he's giving his full, he's giving his full thought on the matter. Yes. Whether the thought is bound by the law or not but his decisions can only be bound by the law. And that's where there might be some, some confusion for people. Mm-hmm. But in his decision itself, if you read it, he is very, 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 very clear. Well, so this is stuff that gets lost in translation when it goes from the court decision to the journalist, to you, right. to somebody hearing it from the advocate, and some of the little uh, specificities get lost or blurred. Yes. Well, and, and let's not forget, he said, with the information that was available at the time, he would have made the same decision. Mm -hmm. But he's doing a hindsight. Which which is what he also said. He says, in hindsight, having the information that I have in front of me now and having the the ability to look at it under a microscope when there's no time to get things done or make the decision, I can say, here's the case. So, like I said, at the time when the ruling came out, I was not mad at him, but I was kind of like, oh, so this means I can just go and take over a city for three weeks? No, no. it doesn't. (laughs) He's very yeah. clear on that, yeah. right? But what he's what he is saying, though, however, is that because um, this is going to be one of the deep grounds of contention is whether the hindsight review is actually the proper legal test for this case, because the government can only make a decision with the information that it has at the that's time. Right. So that's probably going to be one of the main grounds of the appeal. That's why he keeps on saying. I may have erred. Mm. A higher instance of court, a higher instance of justice may decide different. But from from where I see it, with my experience and my knowledge, this this is how I'm ruling. But always with a dose of humility. Mm. Very, very important. So what he says here, specifically, right, is that in paragraph 148, is that when you invoke an emergency, it's an emergency, it's dealt with. It gets dismantled, it's over. So saying that you don't need to take it to take it to court makes the decision evasive of the law, because by the time you file in court, and then you get to court, and then you get a ruling. Right, the public order order emergency commission had to happen within six months, but we're 
two, we're about two years, just, just shy of two years of the events actually having happened when the federal court gave its decision. Well, it's nearly two years after it was dismantled. If you turn around and say, well, it doesn't need to go to court because it's all been solved and removed now, that literally removes any access to legal action or legal recourse if something unconstitutional or illegal did indeed happen. So the judge is going, no, 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 you can't do that either. <laughs> because if you said you use the public order emergency as a substitute for actual judicial review, then the decisions do get to evade the judicial process. And we can't have that. So again, very, very wise decision in the interest of overall democracy for all of us. And you have to remember, right? You may not like that decision as it applies to this because you think they deserved it. Because they were fucking up and they found out. Yeah. But you don't want to use, when you're creating a legal precedent, you want to make sure it's valid for all potential manifestations of that. And the next time it may be somebody who's not on your side. So you want to make sure that you're protected in all cases. The judge is doing this in this case. Paragraph 149, the act's definition of a public order emergency requires that it be temporary, which means that such order will likely have ended long before any legal challenges to the proclamation of an emergency are heard by the courts. The timeline of this case is this point. If the court declines to hear these cases, a precedent may be established that so long as the government can revoke the declaration of an emergency before judicial review application can be heard, the courts will have no role in reviewing the legality of such a decision. You don't want that. You don't want the government to say, hey, Black Lives Matter, you're protesting. I'm invoking the Emergencies Act. Crack down after five days. Okay, we're pulling it, but you violated all our rights. Yeah, but it's done now. So you don't get to go to court. That's essentially mm -hmm. what the government was arguing here. There's a good question from known as. I never read the thing and really appreciate this podcast explaining. Did it say anything about occupation or protest? I believe it did. It, correct me if I'm wrong, sir. But I believe yeah. he did mention that it was an occupation and it was not a protest. Yes, it was definitely a blockade and it was definitely a threat to national security. Yeah. That was definitely, in this specific case, he did rule that about this. Now, for those who enjoy a little bit of judicial history, paragraph 154 lays out one of the reasons for which the Emergencies Act is vastly superior when it comes to protecting charter rights than was the War Measures Act that it replaced. And you got a lot of people saying, oh, Trudeau invoked War Measures. He did not invoke no. War Measures. We do not have a War Measures Act anymore. It doesn't exist. He invoked Emergencies Act measures, and all Written of them are by... legally required to respect the charter which was and not the case with the War Measures War Act. War Measures Act, your rights were suspended. Yes, Period. your rights were outright suspended. Yes. Let's remember, too, who wrote the Emergencies Act. Conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Exactly. Section 1, paragraph 154. The bill introducing the Act in 1984 was amended to drop the loose requirement that Cabinet only needed to be, quote, of the opinion that an emergency existed in favor of the requirement that there be, quote, reasonable grounds for such a decision. The expressly stated purpose of this wording was to empower courts to judicially review emergency proclamations. Bill C-77, an act to authorize the taking of special temporary measures to ensure safety during national emergencies and to amend other acts in consequence thereof. First reading, June 26, 1987. Bill C-77, Minutes of Proceedings and Evidence of the Legislative Committee, 33rd Parliament, Second Session, Volume 1, Number 1, February 23rd, 1988 pages 15 to 16. So the standard was cabinet needed to be of the opinion that an emergency act existed. Boom. We can invoke the War Measures Act. Now you need to have reasonable grounds. And reasonable grounds is something that can be tested in court. Being of the opinion of doesn't. And that's why the Emergencies Act is vast, one of the reasons why the Emergencies Act is vastly superior to the War Measures Act that we had. Now, 
back to the applicant who was bounced. <laughs> um, paragraph 164. The respondent, the respondent argues that neither Kristen Nagel nor the CFN were adversely affected by the invocation of the public order emergency and enactment of the related instruments. By her own evidence, Ms. Nagel continued to willingly act in contravention of the measures by, among other things, soliciting donations, distributing funds, and providing material support to the demonstrators. So basically, the measures were invoked, and she said, boop, she just flipped the bird and said, I'm going to keep doing it anyway. However, quote, she was not the subject of any disclosures to financial institutions or otherwise described to be a designated person. Her bank accounts and financial resources were not frozen, and she was not forcibly removed from participating in the convoy. She chose to leave on February 19th, 2022, of her own accord. Ms. Nagel continued to express her views and to fundraise after the invocation of the act. She was never charged, nor was she ever the subject of any measures taken under the act. So he's basically going like, why the hell were you here? Mm. <laughs> Girl, why are you here? <laughs> She defied the law, wasn't affected at all by the invocation of the EA, but she still kept defying the law until she saw the moment was over. And then when the moment was over, she left. So it seems that this piece of work stuck her nose into this one for visibility and potential compensation. And me, no me, me, look other at me. reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mr. Grizzly. We have yeah, a, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see that? Yeah, it's not in the main chat on YouTube. I'm all gonna, right. Yeah, I'm going to take care yeah. of it. We need to take care of that. Yeah, we're not here to, uh, yeah, for herbalists and WhatsApp mm -hmm. numbers and whatnot. Yeah, no. don't, uh, it, don't. Nobody on YouTube sees that that because that was a Facebook message. So only people watching on Facebook would have seen that, and I've just okay. blocked them. Cool, wonderful. So yeah, now, <laughs> so this is where I do it. <laughs> Paragraph one sixty five. As for the CFN, the respond, that's uh, still talking about Nagel and the Canadian Federation of Nurses, the respondent argues that there is no evidence suggesting that anyone other than Nagel acted on behalf of the organization, that any director, member, or employee of CFN other than Nagel attended the convoy, that CFN took any action separate from Nagel, or that the Emergencies Act affected the CFN any differently than the affected Nagel. CFN was not named a designated entity and its bank account was not frozen. Any potential liability Nagel and the CFN might subsequently face from their involvement is entirely speculative. Moreover, the respondent submits, even if the emergencies measures had caused a temporary reduction in financial contributions to the CFN, judicial review cannot be used to protect interests that are strictly commercial in nature. Hmm. So, um, basically, judge to English translation, girl, your only reason for being here is financial. Sorry, but you will not use my court to whine that the grifting group you set up that only you seem to speak for saw donations dip when people thought twice about consequences. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Basically, yeah. So, but then she continues on grifter to English translation, but judge, I was breaking the law and insisted on keeping breaking it after the A was invoked. They may still investigate my ass and my organization for that. Protect me from consequences. Now, I love this. In paragraph 170. Huh. A declaration by this court that the regulations and economic order breached their rights under the Canadian Bill of Rights or the Charter, or that the proclamations was ultra virus, would eliminate their liabilities. She contends. When you add, she contends. Or the applicant contends at the end of it. Basically, that's the judge going, nah. <laughs> <laughs> but judge, protect me from consequences. Nah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I like this judge. That's why I put it after this one with side note of personal appreciation. Federal court, just, federal court justice Richard Mosley has got a bit of sass going on under those robes. <laughs> that adds a little soup so spicy. Could literally hear his eye roll. <laughs> that a little bit, a little bit. Huh? <laughs> now, two other of the applicants' applicants' cases were also bounced because one of them defied the EA when an application and insulted the court, insulted the court's intelligence while in court. The other was upset because after he got home, people actually called him a dumbass for having been a dumbass. 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> the justice was not having it. Paragraph 171. As noted, the respondent concedes that Cornell and Jerseys have standing as persons directly affected by the decisions under review. Jeremiah Jost also assessed that he was directly and substantially harmed by the act as he was carrying out his charter rights to protest in Ottawa when the act was invoked. He submits. Ooh, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> Next is going to be good. That he received notice of police threats to charge protesters, witnessed police brutality, and was shoved by police and his clothes were torn because of the enforcement of the regulation. Thus, Jost argues his rights to liberty, mobility, and freedom of expression were adversely effective. Affected, and the court should therefore recognize that he has direct standing to challenge the proclamation and related instruments. Harold Ristow participated in the convoy protest in Ottawa for just one day on February 12, 2022, before the regulations and economic order came into effect. He confirmed in his affidavit and on cross examination that the measures did not impede his ability to participate to anything on that day. His bank accounts were not subsequently frozen, and no other action was taken by the police or other authorities against him. Ristow claims that upon returning home, he suffered negative consequences that were caused by the proclamation. These, as he described it in his affidavit and acknowledged on cross-examination, appear to have been due to reactions from other persons within his religious community and place of work who did not agree with his views and were not due to any action taken by the government or the police. So, the second fool went to the court and said, I went home and people hurt my feelings. Therefore, the government should be held responsible. Basically. And the judge said, nah. <laughs> no, 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 we ain't having that. The first one said, well, I witnessed police brutality and my clothes were torn. So therefore, and the judge go, nah. <laughs> F-A-F-O, right? <laughs> I, I said, Seriously. <laughs> and literally says, Ristow was not, in my view, a person affected by the decision to issue the proclamation in any meaningful way. And with regard to Mr. Joss, Mr. Joss chose to remain in the area, notwithstanding clear instruction to depart, and was present when the police clearance operation began. He conceded on cross-examination that the emergency measures did not impede his ability to attend and participate in the protests. He continued to receive and distribute money to other protesters. Mm. Not a good look. While his right to express dissent may have been briefly affected, that was only within the physical confines of the area subject to the regulations. He was free to leave that area and to continue express his dissent elsewhere. Joss's evidence lacked candor and was evasive and misleading on cross-examination. He denied, for example, that loud truck horns were blown at night, despite incontrovertible evidence of this, including on, including on his own video recording. Mm-hmm. So he went into the court and said, judge, this thing that you're hearing on my own video, you're not hearing that. <laughs> he went to court and lacked candor, was evasive and misleading on cross-examination. And the judge basically invoked closing time rules. You don't have to go home. You just can't stay here. <laughs> all you had to do was leave the designated area and you could have continued protesting all you want. And, and the so police now. went around 72 hours before the Emergencies Act was invoked, 72 hours, and handed out leaflets to everybody that was occupying that area. Said, leave or you will be arrested. Simple as that. Leave yeah. or you will. Be. You have a choice. You have 72 hours to vacate or you will be arrested. <laughs> Just think of so much funny. <laughs> people. Then of the other two, so there were four applicants, right? There were those two, and then Cornell and Gersies. Edward Cornell and Vincent Gersies were directly affected by the emergencies measures in that their accounts were frozen. Gersies made exaggerated and misleading statements in his evidence about the effect of the invocation of the act upon him unsupported by any medical or psychological evidence, but I do not find the amount to grounds to deny him standing. The respondent made no claim of unclean hands against Cornell. As a result, I was satisfied that their application should proceed. So two of them did get bounced, did get to stay. Mm -hmm. But the only reason why one of the, those two got to stay, even though he lied to the court, mm -hmm. was because his bank account was frozen. Right. The fact that his bank account was frozen alone, that alone, made it such that his standing could continue, even though he was really, really lying to the judge. 
Again, don't go to court and lie to the judge. Don't lie to national security when they're asking you questions, and don't lie to a judge. They're the two people you do not lie to, and do not lie to your own lawyer in a case that they're, where you're being defended. Those are the three people you do not lie to. Mm-hmm. Ever. Ever. That will come back <laughs> to bite you on the bottom. Uh, so, a little more spicy here from the judge with regarding uh, to Nagel. I am also of the view that Nagel did not bring her application for judicial review with clean hands. Mm-hmm. Mm. While the respondent points to Nagel's history of prior misbehavior, the clean hands doctrine applies to a party's conduct during the court proceedings. Nagel has demonstrated bad faith in these proceedings. She circumvented the court's instructions against broadcasting a virtual hearing to which she had been granted remote access. Moreover, the transcript of Nagel's cross-examination is replete with examples of her efforts to avoid answering questions. Her responses lacked transparency and candor. During the hearing in April 2023, the court was offended by the behavior of lead counsel for Nagel and the Canadian Federation of Nurses. Despite repeated instructions to address the issues, counsel repeatedly made inappropriate and offensive political statements. These grandstanding remarks were clearly intended to play to the audience observing the hearing remotely. I will note that the junior counsel for Nagel, who presented arguments in reply to the respondent later in the hearing, did not engage in the same misconduct. So she came to Grandstad. She lied. She didn't answer questions. She would bro- she was broadcasting proceedings of the court that she was not entitled to, and she hired a principal lawyer who was being a complete jerk. Judge to English translation. Girl, if they haven't come after you or your grifting group yet, perhaps it's because, and listen carefully here, you're not that important. But call us if they do. Bye-bye, nasty. Bye. <laughs> she is a piece of work. And just in case the justice wasn't clear or stuttered, paragraph 185. Apart from these concerns, having reread their memorandum of fact and law and the transcript of their oral submissions, I am satisfied that Nagel consider Canadian Federation of Nurses bring nothing of value to these proceedings. As a result, I find that they lack standing. Their application for judicial review is dismissed and will not be considered further in these reasons. Ooh, 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 ooh. Spicy. Again, I am satisfied that Kristen Nagel and the Canadian Federation of Nurses bring nothing of value to these proceedings. Ooh, ouch. I like this judge. Ah. like i said learned individuals who know the law yes they know what they're talking about yes and then uh, he throws a little shade the way of the other applicants that remained the legal issues raised in the the, sorry the legal issues raised in these raised in these proceedings are just justiciable and both the canadian civil liberties Association and Canadian Constitutional Foundation have a genuine interest in the subject matter, which the respondent does not contest. The two organizations also provide strong public law capabilities to complement the more limited substantive agreements arguments raised by Cornell and Jerseys. In the circumstances, their applications are, in my view, a reasonable and effective means to bring these issues before the court. Both the CCLA and CCF have the capacity to present the evidence and argument required to assist the court in reaching a just determination of the issues, which upholds the principle of legality. All right? Praise for them. Compare and contrast with what he says next. Mm -hmm. The participation of individuals with direct standing, i.e. Cornell and Jerseys, is not a bar to granting public interest standing, nor would it serve, in my view, as a reasonable and effective means of bringing the issues before the court to limit the proceedings to the two private litigants. While as stated in DESU at paragraph 37, a party with standing as of right is to be preferred, all other relevant considerations being equal, that is not the case here. Neither the evidence submitted nor the arguments advanced by the private litigants would have been sufficient to deal with the issues in these proceedings. The CCLA and CCF brought organized and effective submissions to the issues before the the court. Contrary to the respondent's submissions, there has been a definite advantage in having counsel for the two public interest organizations working alongside and to some extent guiding the private litigants to move these proceedings to the point where the issues could be argued on their merits. 
So he's basically telling the other two, he's like, you guys are really, really bad at this. And if it wasn't for the fact that the Canadian Civil Liberties Organ Association and the Canadian Constitutional Foundation were here going, what they really mean is... <laughs> I would have bounced you out on your asses too. <laughs> As, and I can just imagine <clears throat> that there's a moment in court where the lawyers for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and the Canadian Constitutional Foundations are repeatedly giving each other like pained looks going, can you believe we fucking need to share a court case with these motherfucking dipsticks? <laughs> I can't believe I hate the whole thing. <laughs> it's just like, oh, man. Now, the judge lays out the, the central question and the evidentiary standard required to answer, then defines the approach. Paragraph 202. Regarding the issuance of the proclamation, the question for the court is whether the governor and council acting on the recommendation of cabinet reasonably formed the belief that reasonable grounds existed to declare a public order emergency under Section 17 of the Act. Reasonable belief is the point where credibly based probability replaces suspicion. It is a probability rather than possibility-based standard. It's very, very important. And he says, quotes from precedent, Reasonableness review is an approach meant to ensure that courts intervene in administrative matters only where it is truly necessary to do so in order to safeguard the legality, rationality, and fairness of the administrative process. It finds its starting point in the principle of judicial restraint and demonstrates a respect for the distinct role of administrative decision makers. However, it is not a rubber stamping process or a means of sheltering administrative decision makers from accountability. It remains a robust form of review. So, he's setting the framework. This is what we, this is the question. This is how we're going to approach it. The opposing parties then debated how much deference to the court deference the court must give to cabinet's decision making power to invoke the EA. The government of Canada basically says that um, a high degree of deference should be given to cabinet because of its status, quote, at the apex of the Canadian executive developing policy in many disparate areas and because its determinations are, quote, based on wide considerations of policy and the public interest assessed on polycentric criteria. Basically saying, you know, we have to look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. We have to consider a lot of things. You know, so, you know, when we decide that this needs to be invoked, the court should give us a very, very high amount of deference to our decision. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association, however, said that the respondent went too far in suggesting that it is, quote, unconstrained and very difficult to set aside. It ignores the important distinction between the objective determination of whether the statutory thresholds in Section 17 of the Act were met and the discretionary decision of whether to invoke the Act. The Canadian Constitutional Foundation submitted that while Cabinet may be the ultimate decision-making authority, it only has the powers conferred upon it by the Constitution, Statute, and the Common Law. There is no such thing as absolute and untrammeled discretion, and any exercise of discretion must accord with the purposes for which it was given. The judge said, I agree with the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and the Canadian Constitutional Foundation. While the ultimate decision of whether to invoke the act is highly discretionary, the determination of whether the objective legal thresholds were met is not. Interesting. Very, very, very wise decision mm -hmm. again <clears throat> the canadian civil liberties association the canadian constitutional foundation argued as they always do that government redactions and invocations of cabinet confidence must mean something was being hidden but the justice disagrees here claiming that enough evidence had indeed been submitted by the government I am satisfied that even if it is possible to draw an adverse inference against the government in the circumstances, it is not necessary for the court to do so in order to decide the substantive issues. The Section 58 explanation serves as the reasons for the decision to invoke the EA, whether or not they were extensive. There was considerably more disclosure of related documents and adequate evidence before the court, in my view, to determine whether the reasonableness standard had been met or the Charter or Canadian Charter, sorry, Canadian Bill of Rights had been infringed. So the judge says, you know, you're saying that the government didn't provide enough information, wasn't transparent enough. No, they were. They gave more than reasonable. 
evidence here. So if people are wondering, oh, well, the government went there and they were trying to hide something. The government was as transparent as it could be there. Mm -hmm. Very central to the case was whether or not the EA measures needed to be applied nationally rather than to just the national capital area. This is the thing that you were asking about, Mr. Grizzly. Right. Sub <clears throat> paragraph 20, 221 uh, in the decision. Paragraph 17, subsection 2, clause C, requires that if the effects of the emergency do not extend to the whole of Canada, the area of Canada to which the effects extend shall be specified. Where the declaration specifies that the effects of the emergency extend only to a specified area of Canada, subsection 19, paragraph 1, provides that the power to make orders and regulations is limited to that area. Yeah, I didn't know that was the case. Yeah, I didn't know that either. I learned that by doing that as well. Mm -hmm. So what he actually ruled is that a national application was too broad. Mm -hmm. And this will probably be a key point in the appeal because the government Canada is likely to argue that since illegal online funding for an illegal occupation could come from any part of Canada, a national invocation was necessary. Right. This is a legit point of legal contention here. This can be seen both ways. Mm-hmm. It was not happening everywhere, so national was too broad. But yeah, but the activities to support the illegal activity, it's illegal to support an illegal occupation. And since right. that could come from anywhere, the powers had to be national. The government of Canada is also likely to argue that since pop-up actions were taken at border crossings and legislatures in many provinces, national invocation was required to prevent a protester, protester counter-response in the form of an endless game of legislative enforcement whack-a-mole. This intervention... Because what happens is if you're limiting your EA application to certain regions of Canada, mm -hmm. so let's say, let's say they said Ottawa and Coots, and whoops, the protest at the Ambassador Bridge pops up again. Right. They have to go through the whole process from beginning to add that in there. So doing what they did was the right move in the sense that it was quick, it was just and it was required and like you said if it popped up again at the ambassador bridge uh oh now what right as they wrote it it allowed the act to be applied in any other place it would pop up subsequently mm -hmm. but the judge is saying pretty much the act can only apply to where stuff is happening at the time now again in 1988 pre-cryptocurrency, pre-web. That might have been a reasonable expectation. Right. In 2024, that may no longer be reasonable. But the judge can only rule according to the act. So it's an act that needs to be, like I said, revisited. Yeah. Which is why I'm saying that the fact that it wasn't evoked in 34 years, mm -hmm. while it's a blessing that we never had to, the curse of it was that it never got tested because we would have spotted all these things before. Yeah, exactly. Had there been an opportunity and those amendments would have been made. Right. Now, the intervention from the Al uh, Attorney General from Alberta, getting back to them, took shameless balls, considering the province had written to the federal government for help and the Public Order Emergency Commission revelations from then Premier Kenny's text claiming he couldn't get towing help. And uh, just a, like a little reminder here, in paragraph 224, Alberta submits that one of the relevant questions for the governor and council to address before invoking the Emergencies Act was whether the proportions of the situation were such as to exceed the capacity of the province. The, again, this is after they submitted a letter saying that it has exceeded the capacity of the province to deal with it. Yeah. And then in the Public <laughs> Order Emergency Commission, we got the texts from Kenny where Kenny said, you guys really screwed the pooch because he didn't get his help. Mm -hmm. This is from a CBC article. I want you to remind us. In messages, LeBlanc, Dominique LeBlanc, mm -hmm. right, who was uh, at the time, I believe, was the um, oh, the guy that was in charge of FedProv relations within the cabinet, Minister of Interprovincial Affairs, I think, or something like that. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, LeBlanc said, Kenny had written the then premier, Kenny had written, the then premier accused Ottawa of not caring about Canada United States border closure in Coots, Alberta, and complained about the federal decision to decline Alberta's request for military equipment that could help remove protest vehicles. Three days before Alberta RCMP moved in to make the arrests in Coots. 
So Leblas, sorry, Leblas sent the messages to Transport Minister Omar Adalbra, Public Safety Mar Minister Marco Mendocino on February 13th, three days before Albert RCMP moved in to make arrests and coups. And an apparent reference to Trudeau, a message attributed to Kenny said, you got your guy has really screwed the pooch. This trucker vax policy is obviously just dumb political theater, the message said, apparently referring to the federal policy requiring COVID-19 vaccination for cross-border truckers. Calling them Nazis hasn't exactly helped. And now the provinces are holding the bag on enforcement. So Kenny's upset. You left us holding the bag. You screwed the pooch. It's like the, you, you guys screwed the pooch. You didn't send us military equipment. Okay? Military equipment. Remember this, because that's a big deal. It's going to come up later. Mm -hmm. The message continued with an allegation that private vendors would not provide tow trucks or other heavy equipment to, quote, move these freaking trucks because protesters described as crazies were making death threats. So Jason Kenny is sending mm -hmm. texts going, these crazies. <laughs> these crazies, <laughs> referring to them as crazies. He's going, you need to do something to move these freaking trucks. Send in military equipment. Well, isn't that interesting? That's the information that the government had at the time. Yeah. Okay. Now, keep track of this because then Alberta did something afterwards that at the time seemed completely normal. But now that we're we also are looking in hindsight, mm -hmm. it looks rather shady. So stay tuned. It's coming. So all of this happens. And then we get an after the fact, in hindsight statement from the Attorney General of Alberta. And this took some balls, given that the government of Canada did consult with the Lieutenant Governors in Council from all the provinces, including Alberta, prior to invocation. From paragraph 227. Regarding provincial capacity, Alberta argues that in order for the governor and council to conclude that there was a national emergency, it was necessary for it to ask whether the proportions of the situation were such as to exceed the capacity of the provinces. I said, Ottawa didn't ask us. They didn't need to. You sent a letter. Yeah. Requesting it. We all saw it. I saw what you did there. <laughs> After the fact, they're now going, they're going... You didn't ask us if we could handle it. Mm, you, you, you oh, girl, please. Do it. Please. <laughs> Given high probability that then Premier Kenny misrepresented, and here's the thing. So now we're wondering, did Premier Kenny at the time misrepresent in that letter Alberta's ability to handle coups? Because he went for pleading to help that he did not get, pleading mm. for help that he did not get, to dismantling the plot in three days. Well, isn't that special? Yeah. And that's why it's lieutenant governor and council may have done the same. This argument from the government of Canada is reasonable, but it was rejected, however, by the judge. Paragraph 226, the respondent submits that it was reasonable for the governor and council to have an objective basis for its belief that the requirements of a public order emergency had been met based on the compelling and credible information that was before cabinet. The court should guard against a hindsight analysis and assess the governor, governor and council's actions in the context that existed at the time. This is what the government had argued. Mm -hmm. Don't apply a hindsight application because this is what they were dealing with at the time. Now here's something that's very important with regard to Kenny's request for military equipment. You never use the military for policing. It is just not done in a democratic country. The goal of the occupiers was to goad the government into an overreaction mm -hmm. to feed their narrative of tyranny. The moment military equipment or personnel would have been used, the government of Canada would have hung itself. Paragraph 232. The applicants submit that military aid was an answer to this problem as the military could have supplemented the Ottawa police and assist with towing. This, however, was considered by the IRG, the Incident Response Group, and discounted as an option for a reason redacted in the minutes further to a CEA Section 38 claim which the court upheld. That reason was valid. So the government shared with the court what the reason was. 
but the reason was so sensitive that it needed to be redacted. And the judge says, I've seen the reason, and that reason is valid. Mm -hmm. So you got the government of Alberta here, say, sending a letter saying, we can't handle this, send us military equipment, which would have been the worst thing that the government could have done. The military government said no. Then he sends these angry texts going, you left us holding the bag, you screwed the pooch, then managed to dismantle the occupation coots three days later. Hmm. Yeah. So was this just a setup? Had the government said yes for the government of Alberta to then say, oh my God, I can't believe you used the military. That I... Or to give the people at Coots a win? Who knows? You know, it's, 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 it's very suspect when you, when you break it all down like that. Is it, is it all about, uh, was, okay, I'm going to go way out on a limb here and speculate, but based on the email from Candy Bergen, let's make this the PM's fault. Was there a conspiracy in the conservative party where all conservatives across the country were trying to do things to get him ousted? Or to overreact. I, this is, this is the question. And you know, if, if he had brought the military in, that would have been really bad. Even if he had brought just military equipment with civilian mm -hmm. operators? Yeah, bad. Just the bad. The fact that the equipment is there and has the military insignia on it? Mm -hmm. Get those pictures, circulate them? My God, not only did he invoke war measures, he actually sent in the military. Yeah. Okay. Like, but here's the other thing. If the government of Alberta is sending letters saying, we can't handle this, send military equipment, mm -hmm. what other information should the cabinet be taking as in, wow, this has gotten really bad and they really can't handle it? Yeah. Because if one person should know that you don't call in the military for that type of stuff, it should be the premier of a province. And he was asking for it anyway. I'll be back that, in a moment. I'll give you a screen to yeah. look at while I'm... Now, paragraph 233. One problem, according to the Section 58 explanation, was that outside of Ontario, the police could not compel insurance companies to cancel or suspend the insurance of designated vehicles or persons. The applicants in Alberta submit that the provinces could have obtained this power by using their respective emergency legislation. The fact that provinces did not exercise those powers should not mean they were not available and cannot justify invoking the EA, they argue. Provincial decisions not to use authorities within their jurisdictions is not incapacity, Alberta submits. Federal disagreement with provincial decisions not to exercise particular powers is not a sufficient basis to conclude that the situation exceeded the capacity or authority of the provinces or could not be effectively dealt with under existing law. Now, this is super shady super shady and also took balls for the government of alberta to argue because they're basically claiming here in this argument while while they're claiming the federal government could have used other federal laws to break apart this protest and therefore invocation of the act was not required they are at the same time arguing that though it could have used other provincial laws to help but chose not to. The fact of them choosing not to was not enough for the government of Canada to factor in willful unhelpfulness as lack of ability. So they're basically saying, well, you didn't need to have it because we had other laws. We're not going to use those other laws to help you, but we had other laws. And the fact that we had them, even though we decided not to give you a hand by invoking them, still doesn't mean that we weren't able to fix it. So if you had other laws and you claim those other laws would have helped you fix your own situation, but you chose not to use them, you willingly chose to be unhelpful the government should not consider as you having exceeded your capacity. So the way I kind of describe that is like, remember in the days where we had VCRs, right? And you had the clock and some people didn't know how to set the clock. So it was always like flashing 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. If you have a piece of technology, 
and it's not broken, but you don't know how to set it up or use it, it's as good as broken. Effectively, yes. So the government of Alberta is actually saying here, yeah, we had the capacity, for example, to uh, suspend licenses or suspend insurance, because that's provincial responsibility. Mm -hmm. But we said, nah, we're not going to. We're not going to help you. And even though the fact that we said we're not going to help you, you cannot consider that as us having exceeded our capacity to intervene. <laughs> they actually went to court and argued that. Mm -hmm. While there is evidence of them asking the federal government to send in military equipment. That takes the biggest balls and again st starts to be loud. Like, was there a concerted agreement between the federal conservative party and at least the government of Alberta to try and set up the prime minister and the government of Canada to fail here. They asked the federal government to send in military equipment for towing, but they would not invoke any provincial legislation or powers that they had to force the tow truck companies to come in or to suspend the licenses or, su or to suspend the insurance. Yeah, Kit Hugh, they plugged both ends against the middle. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Completely duplicitous. I guess. And then Daniel Smith has the balls to say the court sides with Alberta. <laughs> what we're learning is that Alberta said, yeah, we could help you, but nah. But don't interpret our unwillingness to help as being, meaning that we've exceeded our capacity. If you have the tools but feel you can't use them or don't want to use them, they're as good as being non-existent. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the government of Canada argued, rightfully in my opinion, that a healthy dose of deference for potential overbroadness has to be granted due to a precautionary principle. If the government underassesses or underreacts even just once, a potential, potential massive tragedy can occur. It's that old terrorism argument, right? The government has to be right all the time, but the terrorist only has to be right once. <laughs> And if the terrorist is right, what's the somebody goes, well, why didn't you apply all these laws? Why didn't you hit down harder? But when the government hits hard yeah. it's a loose, and nothing loose. bad happens, yeah. then everybody goes, oh, the government overreacted, Would, which is sort of like the COVID principle when we right, said, where I was right, going. when we go into the COVID and said, if we get through COVID and most people turn around and says, oh my God, we really overreacted. That means that was good. Yeah. yeah. A public health scare uh, and a pandemic, a global public health issue such as covid gee that wasn't so bad why did the government do all that maybe because the government did all that it wasn't so bad it could have been considerably worse remember when they had so freezer trucks reason. outside of new york city hospitals remember that and the trucks were filling up fast remember that <laughs> yep so the respondent argued the situation was dynamic and continuously unfolding in the days leading up to the invocation. The government and council must be able to act before it is too late. The cost of failure can be high. So that's another factor that the government has to consider, and that will probably be a point of contention again in the appeal. Mm -hmm. How much, how much can we use potential for worst case scenario? That hasn't happened yet, but could, and that we sense could happen based on the trend of the way things are evolving. How much ahead of it can we get when we're invoking the Emergencies Act? Because if we underestimate and underreact, right? Let's say they decided to let it go another two weeks and they didn't do it. And then someone did put a bomb mm -hmm. in one of those trucks near Parliament Hill. What would be the story today? Well, there were. Government's incompetent. They didn't keep us safe. Didn't, 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 right? All that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So right now the narrative is, oh, the tyrannical government shut us down. They acted too hard. But if the narrative had been the other one, government didn't act fast enough or hard mm -hmm. enough. Well, let's remember too that, that CSIS had said they had reason to believe in evidence that uh, some of those trucks were carrying weapons. They were given 72 hours to vacate or they would be search, search and seizure taking place. Some people did leave when they were handed those notices. 
And I also noticed, and I keep pointing this out because for those of for those in the know, anyone with a Quebec plate, when they saw the Sûreté de Québec show up, they got in their trucks and drove the hell out of there very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> like it was a parade leaving. And they know why. Yep. <laughs> Only the people that left know why they left. Yes. <laughs> Paragraph 241. It may be considered unrealistic to expect the federal government to wait when the country is, quote, threatened by serious and dangerous situations, as the respondent characterizes the events of January and February 2022, while the provinces and territories determine whether they have the capacity or authority to deal with the threat, or if not, could enact what is lacking in their respective legislative or regulatory toolboxes. However... That is what the Emergencies Act appears to require. Mm -hmm. So basically, the judge is saying, yeah, government, you might actually have a point there that it's unrealistic to expect. If you sit around, let all the provinces say, well, gee, Alberta going, gee, have I exceeded my capacity? I don't know. Let me see and think about this for a week. <laughs> Or, yeah, we do have these other tools that we could use, but, oh, I, I don't think we have the capacity or the authority to use them in this case. Let me sit and think about that for a week. Yeah. As a way to mm -hmm. not do it, not do anything that could possibly cost them votes, let the federal government wear it all, yeah. have to make a decision. So, yes, while that is probably un unrealistic, it is what the Emergency Act as it is written, requires. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that might be an amendment <laughs> that needs to be brought to that act. It's like, you guys need to make decisions quickly, too, so that we can make decisions. Yes. It's, the, again, the, the act needs to be updated. There's, there's, yeah. it, it, it's made up for the War Measures Act, which was pretty draconian. And, and it was a huge improvement, and none of your charter rights are suspended. However, it was written at a time when the world was very different, and it needs to be updated for the 21st century, and they've discovered that there's little holes in the uh, wording of it that need to be changed. Yep. So when we get to an appeal, the grounds that the government might have is that while the federal court justice considered provincial and territorial capacity and authority to act, he did not consider willingness mm -hmm. to act. Yeah. That should probably be put into the law. If a federal, if a provincial government does not have the capacity or authority or will to act, the federal government must intercede. So on appeal, I would focus on this if I were in the court to argue that the decision of the then premiers of Alberta and Ontario to not do everything in their power to help was first influenced by personal political considerations to not upset their base as their jobs were on, on the line. Mm -hmm. Remember, February 14th or 15th, 2022, was 108 days prior to the provincial election in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And as Jason Kenney was concerned, he had a leadership review coming. And we saw what happened to him. And the people that were there are the people whose votes both of them needed. Mm -hmm. So maybe there was a reason they decided not to do everything that they could. Certainly seems that way. And if that was, yes. And if there was a reason, that means both of those premiers put their own personal livelihoods and fortunes above that of the entire country. That doesn't surprise when me. When we say our premiers are the problem, yeah. even in a situation in which the Emergencies Act were, was invoked, they couldn't put their own selfishness aside they, to lift a finger don't care. to help Canadians. They don't care. We've been saying this from day one. They don't care. As evidenced by the fact that, well, let's also consider... Doug Ford's daughter was embedded in Ottawa as part of the occupation with her husband, Doug's son-in-law, police officer 
who was fired from his job because he refused to follow orders. Yeah. So now, there's a whole lot of suspect stuff happening here. Yeah. Now, once again, when Danielle Smith says court sides with Alberta, here's some direct evidence that it did not. <laughs> Section, paragraph 244. A meeting of first ministers was convened by the prime minister on February 14th, 2022 to consult premiers on whether to declare a public order emergency. All premiers participated. There was disagreement as to whether the act should be invoked or applied nationally. Several premiers expressed support. Others took the position that it was not required in their provinces. In my view, contrary to the views of Alberta, this meeting satisfied the requirements in section 35 paragraph one of the act that the lieutenant governors in council of each province in which the effects of the emergency occur be consulted before there is a declaration of a public order emergency. So Alberta actually went to court and said that that requirement was not satisfied. And the judge said, yes, it was. How Daniel Smith got to court sides with Alberta? Once you first accept that Daniel Smith will first lie, will always first choose to lie, then you can begin to understand her. Yeah, well. Then the federal court judge gets a little bolder in calling bullshit on Alberta's claim that it had resolved Coots way before the A was invoked. Here he clearly states that Alberta had done it as it was being invoked. So what I was saying earlier, they were saying this way before and then it was a couple hours before. In section 245, provincial officials had diffused the situation at Coots as the EA was being invoked. He literally says that. Mm. <laughs> and the Premier of Alberta opposed invoking the Emergencies Act. So three days before it was invoked, he sent a letter to the Prime Minister saying, we have exceeded our capacity, please send military equipment. And on the day it was going to be invoked, because he had just dismantled Coots, suddenly he found the ability in three days to do it. It says, well, no, 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 don't invoke the Emergencies Act now. Not on our territory. We don't need it. <laughs> Again, feeding my suspicion that that letter was a setup. Certainly seems to be. They had the capacity all along. Mm -hmm. They just wanted the federal government to come in with the heavy hammer. We have provincial governments that are literally directly working against the nation here. You know, it's not even, they're not even hiding it because <laughs> they're not smart enough to, it would seem. <laughs> yeah. Now, it seems that even though the government of Canada shot, sought to reassure the premiers, saying that where the EA measures were not needed, they would not apply, the court justice did rule that the government of Canada had to be very specific in listing the areas where it would apply at the time that was invoked. The Prime Minister's letter to all premiers February 15, 2022, emphasized that the measures would be applied to targeted areas and would supplement rather than replace provincial and municipal authorities. Subsection 17, paragraph 2, subsection C of the Act requires that if the effects and the emergency did not extend to the whole of Canada, the area of Canada to which it did extend shall be specified. It was open to the Government of Council to specify several or many areas that were affected by the emergency. However, the proclamation stated that, quote, it exists throughout Canada. This was, in my view, an overstatement of the situation known to the government at the time. The emergency was also vaguely described as happening at quote, various locations throughout Canada. I understand that the concern was that new blockades could emerge at any pressure point across the country, but the evidence available to cabinet was that these were being dealt with by local and provincial authorities, aside from the impasse which remained in Ottawa. Now, I don't agree with the judge's assessment here. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Ambassador Bridge thing was dealt with by the government of Ontario, and Coots ultimately was dealt with, and Emerson was all, all you know, something like that. But two premiers had sent, initially, messages to the government saying that they couldn't handle it. Please They had showed an unwillingness to invoke their own powers in order to be able to handle it. 
It was a request for military equipment. So, and whatever they had dealt with, at least in the case of Alberta, was happening as the act was being invoked. Mm -hmm. So at the time, how much evidence did the government of Canada actually have that provincial governments could indeed handle it and handle it consistently Well, and, and again, over a long term? They were begging for help. Yeah. So I'm not, there's probably a legal bone of contention here judicially mm -hmm. when they go to appeals. From what I can gather here, it seems that the government of Canada deliberately chose vague geographic language to retain the response of flexibility in case of geographically fluid whack-a-mole, thus eliminating the need to go through the entire process every time a new location would need to be addressed. The need with such flexibility with reasonable limits given the size of Canada and the ability of the World Wide Web creates for online organization funding to shift rapidly, which didn't exist in 1988. Exactly. This will likely be a point of appeal and legislative amendment consideration. I would argue here that it's very clear why it is the tow truck drivers could not have been dealt with under Ontario provincial legislation because Doug Ford had an election coming up 108 days later and didn't want to anger his base. Mm -hmm. But the government of Canada needs to find the balls to say that in court. Agreed. And I hope they do. I don't know if they will, but I really would like them to. Yeah, because in paragraph 250, Justice Mosley says, this was as of February 15, 2022, that the proportions of the event were of the nature such to exceed the capacity of an authority to deal with it. This was only true in Ontario because of the situation in Ottawa, and that was in part due to the inability of the provincial and municipal authorities to compel tow truck drivers to assist in the removal of blockading the vehicles. It is not clear why that could not have been dealt with under the provincial legislation. It's not unclear. It was political. But somebody has to say it. Yes. And clearly the government of Canada did not say it in this case here. Now, he also says, while I agree that the evidence supports the conclusion that the situation was critical and required an urgent resolution by governments, the evidence, in my view, does not support the conclusion that it could not have been effectively dealt with under other laws of Canada as it was in Alberta, or that it exceeded the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it. That was demonstrated not to be the case in Quebec and other provinces and territories, including Ontario, except in Ottawa. For these reasons, I conclude that there was no national emergency justifying the invocation of the Emergencies Act, and the decision to do so was therefore unreasonable. So, when he's saying that there was, it was not justified, he is saying it's not justified because the act was being applied too broadly on a national basis. Had the act specifically said only for Ottawa, then it would have been justifiable. Mm -hmm. Now, from my perspective, and again, I'm not a legal scholar, I think the justice makes an error in judgment here because he says provinces such as Alberta and Quebec dealt with the issue well. There's no reason it couldn't also be in Ottawa. However, Ottawa, unlike elsewhere, was always the primary target focus of the action. From the get-go, we are going to Ottawa. The level of resources, the effort, the vehicles, the people, the online funding, domestic and foreign, all assigned to Ottawa were so disproportionately larger mm -hmm. than anywhere else that comparing ability to respond as being equal in Ottawa as in the province is probably not judicious. Moreover, regardless of the reasons for the Ottawa shit show, the OPS incompetence, the infighting for nation competing for the National Vanishing Cream Award, willful lack of cooperation from Queen's Park, all the stuff. By week three going to the week four, the scale and scope of the protests were less comparable than what was going on at the provinces. Mm -hmm. And this is where the oversight in not considering provincial willingness to act to assist, in addition to capacity and authority, makes it such that the decision goes a little bit astray. While it may be letter of the law correct, it's not spirit of the law correct. And a judge does have some discretion with regard to spirit of the law. But in this case, the federal court justice maintained with regard to the letter of the law specifically. When the EA was drafted and eventually passed in 1988, its legislative crafters didn't foresee a future in which hyperpartisanship would lead to premiers of parties 
ideologically different from the government of Canada of the day, opting to not put Canada first to gain political advantage. But in 2022, that was a reality both federally and provincially, with Kenny refusing to suspend trucker licenses and insurance, and Ford passing on tripartite meetings, and the then interim CPC leader dining with occupiers as the aspirant leader provided aid and comfort. Exactly. Candace Bergen was having dinner with them. Mm -hmm. Skippy was acting like Skippy the Dishes and bringing them Tim Hortons. Yeah. Ford because these bothered things did happen. Yeah, Ford couldn't be bothered to show up to federal, provincial, municipal coordination meetings to handle the situation in Ottawa. And Kenny said, yeah, I have the power to suspend trucker licenses and insurance, but I'm not going to do it. I don't want to. I'm pretty sure that when the ad act was drafted in 1988, nobody assumed that that was a possibility. You know what? I think you're right because even though politicians back then didn't necessarily do bipartisan agreements on everything and often were at each other's throats, I don't believe, and maybe this is naivete or, or rose colored glasses looking through history, but I honestly don't believe that they envisioned a time where provincial parties who were on the right and in many cases the extreme right would work together to harm the federal government. I honestly don't believe that anybody at the time thought that was a possibility. Yeah. And yet here we are very much a reality in the 21st century and an astonishing reality when you think about it actively working to destroy the federal government. I never thought like they're so bloody power hungry. They don't care who gets caught up in their wake. They don't give a damn who gets harmed as long as they can get the power they seek. Yeah. This is megalomania. Yep. Now what comes next is extremely important because the federal court justice here basically calls bullshit on all those who try to frame the whole thing as nothing but a peaceful and patriotic loving. Paragraph 242. It is not disputed that the discovery of weapons, ammunition, and other materials at Coots was deeply troubling and greatly influenced the cabinet in recommending the invocation of the act, as did the possibility that similar findings would emerge at any of the other blockades across the country. It is not disputed. While the widely published images of people enjoying the hot tub and bouncy castle set up in proximity to Parliament Hill and the war memorial suggest a benign intent, there were undoubtedly, again, there were undoubtedly others present there and elsewhere at the blockades across the country with a darker purpose. And there were threats expressed in social media and other online communications of an intent to resist efforts by the police to dismantle the existing blockades and set up new ones at different locations. Both those threats were being dealt with by the police of provincial and local jurisdiction outside of Ottawa. That last line provokes a huh mm -hmm. from me, but everything else, I guess, and he's actually saying here that the government did have some evidence that new blockades could pop up anywhere, which would explain why they wrote the geographic descriptions in the act the way that they did. But again, he says those were being dealt with by police. And the reason I give that one the question mark is because there seems to say, there seems to be a bit missing there, but admittedly not before could have been added. So the ambassador bridge was dealt with, but not before Ford got a call from the U.S. offering to help him with that. Could you imagine how much more damaging it would have been to our global reputation and for foreign investment to be the G7 country that needed U.S. intervention to resolve a domestic issue, to be seen as the, naval, the nation unable to handle their own shit? Oh, boy. <laughs> the situations in Emerson, Manitoba, and Crutes, Alberta were dealt with, but not before. The premiers of provinces sent panic letters to Ottawa. They had mm -hmm. both hoped would never go public with Kenny seeking military, yikes, equipment. Yeah. Uh, marinate on that one for a couple of minutes. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be a 
the consideration of the complexity and escalation that the Alberta request pertaining to the loan of some military equipment would represent. So, as stated before, the situation in Kutz was ongoing when the federal government telegraphed invocation was coming and ultimately resolved not much prior to the invocation. And finally, although Doug Ford did take action to end act to take the action on the Ambassador Bridge upon resolution, he once again vanished from view, not even showing up to tripartite meetings as if Ottawa was not located in Ontario. He could have acted then, but he chose not to. And this is where there might be a legal point of contention. Mm. The court justice seems to interpret the act as requiring a list of specific locations, but that would make it such that the proclamation would have been useless in places where new hotspots could emerge. So, when the government says that it's stated that the situation exists throughout Canada and at various locations throughout Canada, the federal court justice read those as separate things. I would be arguing that these things needed to be read together rather than as individual statements so that the emergency is not described as existing throughout Canada in one sense and then in another sense at various locations throughout Canada, but described as existing throughout Canada in various locations throughout Canada. Given its potential fluidity, the emergency is accurately, in this case, rather than vaguely described. Both statements taken individually are vague, but together the situation exists throughout Canada in various locations throughout Canada. That is actually accurate. And that is where I would make an argument. Um, then he, the court justice goes on to assess whether or not the threats to the security of Canada threshold was met. Spoiler alert, he rolls not. But for a very unique and interesting reason. Not the reason that everybody would suspect. 257. The meaning of national security is not defined in the statutes. The Supreme Court of Canada recognized that the concept was difficult to define and concluded that a broad and flexible approach to the meaning of the words was required along with a deferential standard of judicial review. Justice Simon Noel concluded that national security means, quote, at minimum, the preservation of the Canadian way of life, including safeguarding the security of persons, institutions, and freedoms in Canada. A broad and flexible interpretation of the words threats to security of Canada could encompass the concerns which led the Governor and Council to include the Public Order Emergency Declaration, had the meaning of those words not been limited by reference to another statute. I would have found that the threshold was satisfied. However, the words threats to the security of Canada do not stand alone in the Act and must be interpreted with reference to the meaning of that term as it is defined in Section 2 of the CSIS Act and incorporated in Section 16 of the EA. So the judge is saying here that were it not for the fact that the Emergencies Act chose to refer to Section 2 of the CSIS Act as a definition of what constitutes a public order emergency, the judge would have found that the threshold was satisfied. Mm -hmm. So the judge is saying, there was a threat to national security. There was one. But since I can only go by what's written in the law, I can't rule that. Which means that the act as written is miswritten and needs to be amended. Now, he's basically saying that those who drafted the Emergencies Act back in 1988 made a mistake by linking the definition of a national security threat to the CSIS Act as that which constitutes one for the purposes of the Act, what constitutes a national security threat for the purposes of the CSIS Act is necessarily too narrow to cover all potential public emergencies. Now, had Canada had the misfortune of having to invoke the Emergencies Act at least once in the last 30 or so years, perhaps that would have been picked up in the mandatory review. But the judge is clearly saying that the emergency was indeed a real-life and national security threat. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where things get really interesting. He ruled that there was indeed a national security threat, that its definition should be included, and that this definition should indeed include threats to the economic security. And were it not for the EA being linked to CSIS, the threshold would have been met. 
He also rules that there is no dispute that the activities had a political and ideological objective. That's not up for debate. <laughs> yes. So in 265, there is no dispute these proceedings were carried out for the purpose of achieving a political or ideological objective within Canada. The question is whether the activities were directed towards or in support of the threat or use of acts of serious violence as the definition requires. Cabinet was presented with evidence to the contrary. The director of CSIS confirmed in his advice to cabinet that the service did not assess that the protests constituted a threat to the security of Canada, which is true. Mm -hmm. Yes. The head, uh, the head of CSIS, uh, Mr. Villeneuve, did testify that according to what is written in the CSIS Act, it did not. But, and that was an article on February 14th, I believe, that appeared um, in CBC. But one week later, uh, sorry, not February, in uh, November, sorry, when the, the Public Order Emergency Commission was taking place. But one week later, it was publicly reported that the day before the Emergencies Act was invoked, the CSIS director advised the Prime Minister to do it, as even in his own opinion, the CSIS Act definition of what constitutes a national emergency is too narrow. Something with which the federal court justice agrees. According to the CBC, CSIS Director David Vigneault testified before the Public Order Emergency Commission Monday and sat for an in-camera session on November 5th. Vigneault told the in-camera hearing that the Prime Minister asked him for his advice at the end of the February 13th meeting of the Incident Response Group during which the Emergencies Act was discussed. And he told him to go for it. Now, this particular piece of advice uh, at the time when I was reading didn't seem to be factored into the ruling. And I did read ahead and I didn't see it, but he did mention it somewhere near the mm -hmm. end. So, so we got... The federal court justice, believing that it was a national emergency, but the letter of the law in the CSIS Act doesn't allow him to rule that the threshold was met. The CSIS director advised the PM that the spirit of the law in the CSIS Act is such that the threshold was met. And the federal court justice rules there is no dispute that the activities had a political and ideological objective. Here's where I speculate. Mr. Grizzly, if you'll put this up. Just a second. This is the definition of terrorism in Canada under section 8301 of the criminal code defines terrorism as an act committed in whole or in part for a political, religious, or ideological purpose, objective, or cause with the intention of intimidating the public with regard to its security, including its economic security. Or, or, or. The judge in paragraph 265, there is no dispute that these proceedings were carried out for the purpose of achieving a political or ideological objective within Canada. Sounds like terrorism to me. Uh, yeah. By definition. Given the definition of terrorism in the criminal code, one can legitimately wonder, were it not for the CSIS Act definition, would the federal court judge have ruled that it was also terrorism? Yeah, it's well, one, one I mean, <laughs> all signs, Magic 8-Ball, all, sign, all signs point to yes. <sighs> wow. I like it, James, here. Sometimes when Paul's looking to his right, imagine it's at a menu of craft beers for some reason. <laughs> I'm working. I'm working. But I, I wish, because, you know, I yeah. I know it's very early, but, you know, there, there are breakfast beers. They, they do make them. Uh, uh, matter of fact, when I was in Frankfurt and I was at the airport, 9 a.m., I had a Munich breakfast, which is two yes. boiled white sausages yes. and a liter of beer. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, so two boiled white sausages with mustard and a gigantic pretzel and a liter of beer. Yes. Now we get to some very interesting competing legal arguments. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association and Canadian Constitutional Foundation appear to have argued that the government of Canada could not have legitimately feared, despite the coup's arrest, that serious violence, not just any or mere violence, but serious violence was afoot because none had yet happened. The government of Canada argued that the cumulative violence to date and the increasing potential for serious violence was enough. The justice's test appears to be that the government of Canada could only act on what it knew at the time. 
Now, there's legitimate legal debate to be had here about whether in a national emergency situation, the government of Canada also needs to factor in the increasing risk for serious violence, despite it not having intelligence pertaining to specific imminent plans or acts. Though the government of Canada legitimately argued that shortages of essential supplies due to successful border blockades could lead to serious violence, objectively, those blockades had not come close to succeeding in creating such an imminent threat because they had been dismantled beforehand. Right. So the justice rules. Serious violence to property could encompass, could encompass, sorry, serious violence to property could encompass destruction or damage to critical infrastructure, such as the electrical grid or natural gas supply required to heat homes or run industries across the country. I am unable to find that the term encompasses the type of economic disruption that resulted from the border crossing brocades. It may be that Parliament will wish to revisit the question of whether the CSIS Act definition, which serves the several purposes of that statute, adequately covers the different harms that may result from an emergency situation when they may fall short of serious violence to property. This court can only apply the law as it finds it. It has no discretion to do otherwise. Interesting. Again, well, look at, look at that. Yes. <laughs> now, obviously, there were not any expressions of threats to destroy the nation's critical infrastructure. That is true. That did not happen. They wanted to block the borders, bring the right. country to its knees economically, but they never said, hey, let's go blow up a pipeline. No, but they did They did do a slow roll at airports. Yeah. Which is blocking infrastructure to a degree, but not destroying it. Although the potential for uh, catastrophic accidents was very much there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially the way they were stirring, stirring the diesel near the National Arts Center and National Defense. Right across, yeah. Gone, boom. Like... That was a gigantic bomb. Yep. Yep. You can't tell me otherwise when you have hundreds and hundreds of liters of individual tanks of diesel stored in an unsafe area in plastic containers. There's a reason it was dismantled very quickly. Yes. <laughs> Mere meters from the National Defense Headquarters, of which, yes, National Defense Headquarters now has a new campus, but that building is still very much in use, and there are mm -hmm. people who work there every day. So. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Other than a diesel depot. That was not. Yeah. So the justice does accurately review rule, in my opinion, that though it's a good idea to review the law to fill that gap, he doesn't have the liberality to read that into the given law as written very wisely. For that. Now here's some important legal history. Even if it had been determined that there was enough serious, there was a serious level, enough of violence, that alone would not have been enough mm -hmm. for the judge to rule. That the CSIS director ultimately agreed with invocation alone is also not enough. Section 284. I agree with the applicants that the CSIS assessment that there were no threats to the security of Canada within the of the paragraph C definition must be given some weight. The parties agree that it is not determinative of whether the government of Canada could or could not invoke the act, nor is it determinative that the director of CSIS ultimately agreed with the decision to invoke. Cabinet had available to it other sources of information which could satisfy the definition of threats to national security, which is true. The definition of threats to the security of Canada in the CSIS Act, and this is very important, was designed for a different purpose. The definition was intended to constrain the activities of a, the new security service and to serve as a threshold for the exercise of its non-intrusive investigative powers and its ability to obtain a warrant for more intrusive measures. It was not designed for the purposes of the Emergencies Act. When Bill C-77 to enact the Emergencies Act was being considered, the CSIS Act definition had the virtue of having been recently considered and adopted by Parliament and was dropped into the draft legislation for the Emergencies Act to respond to concerns that its scope was otherwise too broad and would capture minor threats or use of violence. The effect was to raise the level of the test to be met by the government and council, governors and council. So, we're getting some judicial history here. So, the definition in the Act, the CSIS Act, is meant to constrain the activities of CSIS. You can only wiretap people or get these warrants for these really intrusive measures if there is a national security threat, as you would define it as CSIS. But when we were writing up the EA, we're saying, well, how do we define a national security threat? And earlier on, we said that the judge said that even the Supreme Court says that defining what a national security threat is 
is, is very difficult. So they turn around, hey, we just did the CSIS Act. We all agreed what it was for this purposes. Let's just take that paragraph and drop it into this one. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Well, in 2024, we're, real, we're learning not so easy, easy, easy peasy, right? Mm -hmm. They need to go back and define what constitutes a national security threat or a national emergency for the broader purposes of an Emergencies Act and not just for CSIS, being able to get a wiretap. We all know what I did when that happened. So they basically took the easy way out mm -hmm. when they did the act in 1988. They didn't do the hard work of defining it. They True. just said, hey, we just discussed this. Let's throw this in there. Amendments are required. So the judge states that even if he agreed that the CSIS Act definition is insufficient, he had no discretion to rule accordingly and no duty to grant exceptional deference to the government, noting that the Privy Council Office rightfully advised that invocation of the Emergencies Act was vulnerable to legal challenge. The Privy Council Office did send a note to the government saying, you're going to do this, but it's going to be vulnerable to challenge. He also notes that the testimony pointed to the fact that discovery of the plot at Coots was the straw that broke the camel's back with regard to the government determining it was go time. But the justice states that given the only other expressed threat of violence was to tow truck drivers, it wasn't enough, despite government fears about potential for serious violence, particularly if operations to subdue longer festering threats did not occur smoothly. So the government was worried that, um, for example, it says in 291, there was a great deal of speculation about what might happen if the protests were not brought to an end. This was raised several times in the Public Order Emergency Commission testimony of the Minister of Public Safety. And they're figuring, you know, if we make an attempt to dismantle this and it doesn't go smoothly, then what? So maybe we should act now. Well, we know we can do it smoothly. Mm -hmm. The court justice reiterated that though the activities in Ottawa did not constitute serious violence, were it not for reference to the CSIS Act, he still would have ruled that there existed a legitimate threat to national security based on other activities throughout the nation. 295. Ottawa was unique in the sense that it is clear that the Ottawa police services had been unable to enforce the rule of law in the downtown core at least in part due to the volume of protesters and vehicles. The harassment of residents, workers, and businesses, owners downtown Ottawa, and the general infringement of the right to peaceful enjoyment of public spaces there, while highly objectionable, did not amount to serious violence or threats of serious violence. This is not to say the other grounds for invoking the act specified in the proclamation were not valid concerns. Indeed, in my view, they would have been sufficient to meet a test of threats to the security of Canada had those words remained undefined in the statute. The harm being caused to Canada's economy, trade, and commerce was very real and concerning, but it did not constitute threats or use of serious violence to persons or property. For these reasons, I'm also satisfied that the government and council did not have reasonable grounds to believe that there was a threat of national security existed within the meaning of the act, and the decision was ultra virus. So in other words, again, were it not for the fact that back in 1988 or 87, mm -hmm. People decide to take the lazy way out. I would have judged you right. Funny how that works. And we wouldn't be here. And for people who are wondering, ultra virus is a Latin phrase that's used in law to describe an act that requires legal authority, but is done without it. So the decision was done without legal authority. But these, this is the only reason. Because it actually was but because government had constrained itself over 30 years ago with the definition of the CSIS Act. Now, with regard to specific rights, the right to freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, 
Despite no evidence of law enforcement infringing upon these rights, the regulations as written weren't specific enough to exclude those present legitimately protesting, opening the door to potential violations. And that is the reason for which the judge ruled. So, good reason. It's not that the rules were wrong. He says, the scope of regulations was overbroad insofar as it captured people who simply wanted to join in the protest. It is not suggested that they would have been the focus of enforcement efforts. However, under the terms of the regulations, they could have been subject to enforcement. And given the lack of a common standard with regard to disclosing bank information, there was probably a lack of a common standard with uh, the application of this as well. Certainly seems to be. So even though it was enforced constitutionally, the fact that it was written so broad, broad that people that just wanted to join the protest innocently could have been caught up in it, made it so. Mm. So what the judge is saying is that you can do this, you just need to be a little more specific. And that's the reason why. Other than that, rights of freedom of thought, belief, and opinion, and expression were all respected. It was just that one little thing. With regard to the right of freedom of peaceful, peace, peaceful assembly, the judge ruled that the occupation did indeed breach the peace and measure, did indeed breach the peace and measures used to restore it did not violate charter rights. The EA expressly authorizes the making of orders or regulations that prohibit any public assembly that may reasonably be expected to lead to a breach of the peace. This is anticipatory language. The legislation clearly permits special measures to prevent public assemblies that will likely lead to a breach of the peace. I agree with the respondent that, quote, gatherings that employ physical force in the form of enduring or intractable, intractable occupations of public space that block local residents' ability to carry out the functions of their daily lives in order to compel agreement with the protester's objective are not constitutionally protected. I therefore find no breach of the charter right of peaceful assembly. It was an occupation and you can't do that shit. Period. That's what he's saying. And every time I come across somebody online who goes, it wasn't an occupation, it was a protest, I'm like, I lived here, through it. It happened in my neighborhood. People, and PNC Bio points out, vulnerable members of the society that we live in, in my community, in my neighborhood, were deathly afraid to leave their homes. So to tell People me it wasn't an occupation. People couldn't go to work. People couldn't go to medical services. People couldn't have food delivered. It, the, the young lady who was uh, got pushed down on the sidewalk for wearing a mask when she was walking to work. Businesses closed because, as as Zexy Lee said, it felt like uh, a purge, like atmosphere. You could literally feel the tension in the air everywhere you went. It was not a time to feel safe and secure, not even in the privacy of your own home. With I live regard- here firsthand. I know what I'm talking about. And people come out and deny what I, my experience was. I want to slap every one of them. Yeah. With regard to freedom of association, we get back to closing time rules here. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. In my view, the special measures adopted to deal with the occupation of Ottawa and blockades at other locations did not infringe upon the participants' freedom of association. They were free to communicate with each other in pursuit of their collective goals and form whatever organization they thought was necessary to do elsewhere. Mm-hmm. I find no breach of charter, section 2D. With regard to the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, the Canadian Civil Liberties Organiza- Association, the Canadian Constitutional Foundation, argued that any measure threatening imprisonment is a charter violation. But the federal court justice ruled that given they were temporary and subject to judicial review, nah, next. <laughs> Just this is a with very regard, good, very good point from Linda M here. Security of person is also a charter right, although I don't see the CCLA fighting for that. Well, this is the one that we just argued here, right? They said any measure threatening imprisonment. He goes. The applicants argue that, that this provision, creating an offense punishable by imprisonment, engages the liberty interested protected by Section Seven. The fact that no one was actually charged is irrelevant. Argued. The Canadian civil says, well, they could charge, but that, 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 no one, well, that's irrelevant, they said. Mm-hmm. At first impression, the extension of the temporary measures throughout the country, including 
where no disruption had occurred would appear to have been overbroad. However, a party asserting a violation of Section 7 must not only show that the impugned law interfered, impugned law, sorry, interfered with or deprived them of their life, liberty, or security of the person, which laws do all the time, but also that the deprivation in question is not in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. In this instance, the deprivation was temporary in nature and subject to judicial review as these proceedings have demonstrated. And the result, I am not prepared to find a breach of Section 7. That's pretty clear. Under the right to unreasonable search or seizure, the federal court judge ruled that freezing of funds, because there are no property rights and funds are property, mm-hmm. wasn't the issue. There's a plot twist. They were saying they froze my accounts. That's it. That wasn't the issue. The issue was the accompanying requirement to disclose data about bank accounts and credit cards. And that's what constitute a charter violation of seizure of data. Not seizure of the accounts and not seizure of the funds. This is a part that didn't get much play in the media. The applicants argue the economic order empowered financial institutions to freeze the assets of any designated person which constitutes a seizure within the meaning of Charter 8. The economic order required financial institutions to disclose private information, such as what money people have and how they spent it regarding designated persons to the RCMP or CSIS. That is a search, the applicants contend. While the purpose of Charter Section 8 is to protect privacy rights and not property, I am satisfied that the disclosure of information about the bank and credit card accounts of the designated persons by the financial institutions to the RCMP constituted a seizure of that information by the government. Financial records are part of the, quote, biographical core of personal information which individuals in a free and democratic society would wish to maintain and control from dissemination to the state. Therefore, bank bank account and credit card information can reveal personal details about someone such as their financial status and lifestyle choices, and therefore seizure of that data, the data, was ruled unconstitutional, but not the seizure of the accounts or the funds the freezing of the accounts and the funds. The federal court justice ruled that a lack of a common standard, I told you to put a pin in this Mm -hmm. because this would come, applied by an independent third party to determine whether a financial institution had an obligation to disclose the information constitutes an unconstitutional search. Quote, the applicants further submit that Section 5 of the economic order did not meet the requirements of a reasonable search as there was no prior authorization or involvement of a neutral third party such as a judge. Financial institutions had to disclose information without delay any time they had a reason to believe that someone was a designated person. The economic order did not define or provide any guidance on what that standard or for that belief was. So basically, the judge is saying here is that we have we do have a precedent for an independently applied common standard. For example, with our FinTrack law. Mm-hmm. So in this case, by checking that check and balance makes it such that a financial institutions effectively acted as agents of the police and became part of the government, which is a no-no. Yeah. But that alone wasn't enough. There needs to be an additional test in order for things to be ruled unconstitutional. 340. In requiring the financial institution to act on the instruction of the RCMP, the economic order effectively enlisted them as subordinates of the government and engaged Charter 8. The act was truly governmental in nature to implement the temporary measures enacted by the government and council, governors and council, and thus brought the banks and other financial services providers within the scope of Section 8 to the extent of that activity. I find that failure to require that some objective standard be satisfied before the accounts are frozen breached Section 8. Whether that could be justified in the circumstances depends on a Section 1 analysis. So, in other words, he's saying that had it just had to go to a, a judge first or some independent party say, Okay, the bank says we have a designated person, judge. This Does this meet your standard for you? Yes. Okay, then we give the information to the RCMP. Had they done that, everything would have been fine. So when they're out there screaming, it's unconstitutional. It's like, <laughs> barely. Barely. No, not, not really. Yes. Not. Now, Section 1 analysis is the Section 1 of the Charter that says rights can be limited by law so long as those limits can be shown to be reasonable in a free and democratic society based on two questions. Is there a pressing need to limit that right? And is the applied limit reasonably minimal? 
The party seeking to uphold a limitation on a right or freedom guaranteed by the Charter bears the burden on a preponderance of probability to demonstrate that the infringement is justified. Two central criteria must be satisfied. The objective must be of sufficient importance toward overriding a constitutionally protected right of freedom. This is usually referred to as a pressing and substantial objective. And second, the means chosen must be shown to be reasonable and demonstrably justified as proportionate. The issue is whether the right was infringed was as the issue is whether the right was infringed as little as is reasonably possible within a range of reasonable options, leaving a reasonable margin of actions available to the state. Now, these questions are particularly important to this case, given that political speech is granted the highest level of protection because of its essential role in democratic life. That's the overall context which this is placed for this context. The court justice ruled that claiming search and seizure power in and of itself breaches the charter would be going too far. Because police have to see, search and seize stuff mm-hmm. in order to be able to. So saying that that itself goes too far is not. It has to, said everybody agreed, even the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, Canadian Constitu- Constitutional Foundation, that there was a pressing need for action to be taken. But the court justice ruled that they were not applied such as to be minimally impairing. That's where it fell down. There was no real dispute between the parties that the government had a pressing and substantial objective when they enacted the measures, he says. But I agree with the respondent that the objective was pressing and substantial and that there was a rational connection between freezing the accounts and the objective to stop the funding blockades. However, the measures were not minimally impairing. And when he's talking about that, he says, for example, for example, in cases of joint accounts or other account, other account holders not involved in the activities could not access frozen funds. This, in addition to the lack of an independently applied standard to disclose account holder data, this did not meet the minimally impairing test. The respondent acknowledges that the suspension of bank accounts and credit cards affected joint account holders and credit cards issued on the accounts to other family members. Thus, someone who had nothing to do with the protests could find themselves without the means to access necessaries for household and other family purposes. There appears to have been no effort made to find a solution to that problem while the measures were in effect. Of particular concern from a Section 1 justification perspective is that there was no standard applied to determine whether someone should be the target of the measures or process to allow them to question that determination. It was all informal and ad hoc. Having found that the infringements of Charter Sections 2, B, and 8 were not minimally impairing, I find they were not justified under Section 1. That's the only reason. Mm -hmm. Now, people will turn around and say, well, you know, if you have a joint account holder, what would stop that person to just take money from the account and send it to the other person? the fact that financing an illegal occupation is illegal. Now, nothing would have stopped them from doing it. They could have done it had they chose it, chosen to, but there was a legal recourse to go after them after the fact had they had done that. So, again, too broad, not minimally impairing, but that's the only reason. Two of the citizen applicants deemed to have standing argued an independent third-party approval process was insufficient that only a full judicial process would respect the charter rights. So they're basically saying, hey, if you're going to freeze my bank account, we should have a full court case on this rather than just a judge, you know, the bank asking the judge, judge, should we do, be doing this in this case? And the judge saying yes. Uh, the federal court justice said, nah. <laughs> on that one. Say, because basically... What was happening, what would happen is that all these people that would have had their accounts frozen could have said, I want this case, I want this case, and then you would have a long parade of litigation, two-year, three-year court cases that would have gone completely against the spirit of an emergency measure. If you have to wait for a full trial to happen before determining that you can freeze an account in an emergency situation, then the emergency law is pretty much moot, isn't it? So he said no. So overall, during the case, though the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and the Canadian Constitutional Foundation argued many points with regard, they argued like five or six different sections of the charter had been breached. They lost on more than they won. That part was also not reported in the media. They won on a few, but they lost on more than they won. So they went very broad and lost on almost all of them. The federal court justice's ruling provided guidance 
on how to avoid similar measures being ruled unconstitutional in the future. So again, they weren't so unconstitutional that there were not remedies for them that could have been applied. Regulations written more carefully so enforcement could not be applied upon any and all protesters, a standardized independent third-party approval process for disclosure of financial information, and a less impairing process to freeze funds, as well as a more precisely defined statement as to which geographical areas the EI measure would apply, would have been enough to make the whole thing entirely constitutional. Seriously. <laughs> However, it seems that there was no getting around the definition of a national security threat as defined in the CSIS Act to which the EA refers when it comes to justifying its application in this case, even though the court justice did rule that there was indeed such a threat. Given the strong likelihood that such actions could take place again, it's probably incumbent, it's absolutely incumbent, upon a government to consider bringing about amendments to bring that definition into the current technological and political age. However, the likelihood of a current government, this one, considering opening that can of worms prior to the next election, I would assume is quite low. Because if they were to do that, the entire news agenda would be seized with that and nothing else. And the opposition distortion. That, oh, look at this. They're going to you know, change the law to be even, he's going to give himself more tyrannical and dictatorial powers now. Mm. That would distract and drown out any re-election strategy that the government of the day might have. So this needs to be done. It probably won't be done before the next election, whether or not any government has the balls to do that. That's a good question. Because any government could say, well, what's the likelihood of this happening again now? We don't need to touch that. But we need to touch that. So he ruled that it was not justifiable because of the definition of national security threat in the CSIS Act and for no other reason, while saying that that act wasn't enough and the law should probably be amended to be brought to modern day. And then the two points on which he ruled that things were unconstitutional are all things that could have been remedied by being a little more careful with wording and being a little more deliberate with process. And he actually gave him all the remedies. So this decision wasn't as big a victory for the other side as they're claiming it is. And there are lots of grounds for potential argument. What about what if the provinces are not willing to act? Mm -hmm. How much foresight can we put in, even though there hasn't been serious violence yet? You know, we go from people gathering, improperly storing things, to people starting assaulting on streets, to now finding caches of guns. Yes, there's a clearly an escalation. When do we get to say now? What is the consequence of a government for not acting fast enough or forcefully enough versus acting too hard? Mm -hmm. All these are points of contention that can be brought into an appeal. So the appeal process will definitely be interesting. But I'm finding it hard to see how the Supreme Court of Canada will probably get a, will be able to get around the justifiable part because if it is linked indeed to the CSIS Act and that is the law is written. And on the unconstitutional part, given that the manners in which it was unconstitutional was more, it wasn't a question of, in this case it was a question of it ain't what you did, it was the way that you did it. Seizing the bank accounts was fine. Getting the information was fine. Yes. Targeting certain, pro making the laws apply to certain protesters was fine. It just needed to be more specific and deliberate in how they did it. So those are lessons learned for next time. But there should be somebody working, for example, in setting right now what a common standard would be in case of a national emergency at how you access bank data which can then be applied. Somebody should be working on that right now <laughs> based on that decision to make sure that that's in place. 
somebody should be make, working on when we have a mass gathering, how do we write to whom this applies so that it doesn't exclude people who are legitimately there for legitimate protest? Somebody should be working on that now and try to test wording. The big part, though, the amendments to the law itself to make it relate to something other than the CSIS Act. I don't know who's going to have the courage to take that on, but it needs to be done, especially if the federal court judge is right in his ruling that given technology today and all that kind of stuff, that we should probably consider this as a forevermore threat. Mm. It's not something that governments have the luxury of assuming, now. Nah, this might probably never happen again. We don't need to do that. We don't need to take the political fallout from doing that. Somebody's got to do it. In the best interest of democracy, somebody's got to do it. Now, the real politic of it is that probably nobody will try it before the next election. But should the current federal government get elected again, it should probably be the first thing on the agenda. It's making the patches to this law. All right, kids and cubs, that was a long one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're pushing the three-hour mark. Something yep. James uh, put here, and and I'm like, I don't know if this was ever addressed in the ruling. Okay, hold on, I'm looking at it here. I still haven't heard what was accomplished for freezing. I, I don't understand the question as asked. Yeah. If you can rephrase it, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, just as written, I'm not taking um, issue with your question. I just don't understand it okay. as you've asked it, as you as, as you wrote it. Um, so please, if you can re rephrase it, that might help me. This is a, a good thing from Linda, too. Anyone who didn't leave once they were told it was an illegal, illegal occupation was not there for a legitimate protest. That's probably a safe assumption here. Mm -hmm. Well, and... and Let's let's remember the very first person who was arrested. Do you remember the very first person who was arrested? Oh yes, you were telling me yes. So a black man who was black man from the East Coast who was protesting the protesters. Yeah, and he's an immigrant too, by the way. So, ah, what was accomplished by freezing the bank accounts? Uh, the judge does not rule in terms of what was accomplished by freezing the bank accounts. My best assumption is that the government was looking for non-physical mm -hmm. and violent ways to get the protest to disperse because it was very much aware that they were just waiting for images of billy clubs and pepper spray and whatnot. So in others, by freezing a bank account, saying, you know, well, you're staying here and I don't know where you're sleeping and I don't know where you're eating, but right now you don't have access to money. So if you'd like to eat and you'd like a place to stay, you might, you might want to go home would be motivation enough to get enough people out. One would hope. A lot of people out and enough people out so that the hardcore people that would stay there wouldn't have other people there. They could be more easily subdued. That would be my guess, is that the government was looking for the least physical and the least violent ways in order to be able to do that and uh, chose their measures accordingly. And in this case, it was successful because it was a textbook dismantling very kid glove. Mm -hmm. Um, so that would, uh, that would be my guess here. And again, um, the judge did rule specifically that freezing of bank accounts is not a charter violation because there are no rights to property in Canada, no property rights and money is property. What the judge did rule was the violation of the constitution was the obligation of the banks to surrender data related to the accounts mm -hmm. and not just freezing the funds. So yes, the potentially dangerous domino effect for denying access to their own money. Yes, absolutely. But again, that's, that has been a situation that has existed forever in Canada because property rights have never been enshrined in the constitution. So even without an emergencies act inv inv invocation, a bank account can be frozen. As Mr. Well, said, the CRA does it all the time. Yeah, they do it all the time. Here, let's let's yep. take Fre one. freezing a bank freezing bank accounts is I won't say r routine, 
but it under the law it's treated pretty much as a routine measure let's speak about bank accounts for another moment or two shall we isn't there about a million dollars that's still unaccounted for there's a lot of money unaccounted for and just 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 a thing i noticed it looks like tamara leach has had some uh, surgery recently mm-hmm. of both the oral and uh, uh chestral area if we will mm-hmm. not that there's anything wrong with that if you have the funds to get your teeth fixed i'd love to be able to do it but so I, long don't as have the 30 grand. Funds. I don't have thirty thousand dollars to do it yeah. so long as they're your own funds yeah and not you know yeah. Yeah, exactly. So hey, I'm not. I'm not saying she absconded with a million dollars, but all the signs point to that's what took place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could James ask, is there a historical example of this kind of denial of someone's money that isn't about the CRA? Uh, I'm not informed enough to know. Have to take a look at the FLQ crisis when the War Measures Act was enacted back Probably. in 1970. Was that 70 or 71? Just watch me. And need to take a look at that. It's entirely possible that bank accounts were frozen at the time because all civil liberties were suspended. Like, your rights were gone during that time. Which is why, you know, it's, it's Thor's hammer is what the War Measures Act was. It was extreme. And it was, the War Measures Act was written in 1914. It was only ever enacted in 1970. And yeah, it, it was abolished and, and rewritten as the Emergencies Act. And as it so appears, there are holes in the, in the act that was written at a time when the world was very different. So it's something that should, and absolutely should be revisited every, I don't know, every decade maybe. Every 10 years, you tell me what, what do you think would be reasonable because it does cost money to look at and, and rewrite an act of that nature. So, you know, it's something that should be looked at regularly. What's the timeline on that? I don't know who determines that. I don't know, but it is something that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I did a little lookup, uh, Kid James, uh, and this might be some, I, I don't know of cases specifically, but bank accounts are typically frozen for suspected illegal activity, a creditor seeking payment, or by government request. So, for example, um, let's say you were uh, operating a business that was fleecing someone. Your bank account might be frozen in, in that. Um, if you were suspected of uh, uh, being a flow-through for terrorism activity, if your bank well, account might be frozen. And by definition, that, that was a terrorist activity. Yeah. So I, I get what I get what you're saying here, James, and, I, and I'm not going to completely disagree with you. I understand what you're but saying. But there there has to be good reasons, like right? Those, these te- normally there is a test before a bank account is frozen. Somebody has to go and get a permission and says these are the reasons we want to freeze a bank account. You now a judge will say yes or no, we're not, and you'll get the permission. There'll be a warrant for that type of thing. Mm-hmm. The problem was that in this case it wasn't. There was no independent third party test. Right, FinTrack, I'm guessing through FinTrack, there are probably bank accounts that are frozen or suspended quite often when, when they notice something. Yeah. But here in the, the, the crux of the problem here was the lack of an, an independent third party determining. It was the banks where banks were looking and saying, hmm, this has some suspicious activity, RCMP, here's the information. And that's all there was to it. And that standard isn't high enough. So it's not like these laws that you know just exist in a vacuum and say, you know, police can go turn around and say, hey, I want to seize a bank account, seize it, or freeze it. It's not that there's a standard. They have to give a justification, it has to go a reason, it has to go to an independent third party who assesses it, and then a decision happens, just like if just for the case of obtaining a search warrant or a wiretap. It has to go through certain processes before it gets there. And the problem with this case here in, in case of the uh, the occupation is that was not followed. In this case, they did not set up one for this specific uh, situation. But I don't think, uh, I think it's pretty much well established in law, uh, much like the judge ruled that, you know, you can't say that search and seizure is unconstitutional because how would police do their job mm-hmm. like this? I mean, you know, they do that all the time but there needs to be some basis and some justification and some standards and hurdles that are met and criteria that is, uh, that is satisfied before that can happen. 
and and it has to be subjected subjective um, it has to be able to be subjected to a legal review afterwards or legal recourse in the case um, and all these all this is uh, all this in normal times when these laws are being applied are satisfied so there um, so that, that that's about the best I can uh, I, I can give you on that, uh, James, not uh, having a, a background in law enforcement or in law. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, thank you for that nice compliment, actually. By the way, this was the most informative three hours ever regarding Very this issue. Sure. Grateful to you guys. Well, uh, thanks, kids. Uh, I, I do hope that you, you, li- you liked this because it, it was quite an endeavor to go through it and come out those points. That uh, thread uh, that I went through when I said it was a thread actually had... Um, if I add the shameless self-promotion asking for people to support me on coffee and then adding the full text <laughs> of the decision at the end had um, 110 tweets. So you're going to go to uh, unroll, please? <laughs> thread reader unrolled? Yes, I, I need to do that. Put a thread reader unroll and then just post it as, as, as one thing. Um, if, but you're like looking I said, for a, if you're looking for a nice pilsner, uh, I would suggest Vim and Vigor. Which is uh, from, uh, I'd have to, is, is it uh, Dominion City who brews from and figure? Or is it Tooth and Nail? It's a very nice Pilsner if you're looking for one. Okay, for the people <laughs> listening at home, because that just came out of the blue, Kid James had asked, Paul, which craft beer do you recommend? Because he was looking off screen again. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, well, thank you, kids. Uh, yeah, wow, oh, nice, nice compliments here. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Vim and Vigor's have. tooth and nail. What else do we have here? Uh, I worked in AM Douglas Daily. I worked in AML for a bit. Says Kit PNC Bio. I don't know what that exactly means, um, but uh, yeah, if you can let me know, I would appreciate it. That, but uh, yeah, okay. I'm getting some comments here from the kids. They seem to have uh, enjoyed it. Great convo. Have a good weekend, everyone. Lovely. I, I, I'm hoping that you did find some uh, some usefulness in this because, um, like I said, it. It was covered. Mm-hmm. It was covered. And it was covered intensely, but we got the short cold note versions, and you know, it was just like, you know, it was hard to really start. and unjustified. But why specifically? Mm-hmm. Like I said, how unconstitutional, right? And so, basically, mildly unconstitutional and unjustifiable because back in 1987, people were too lazy to find a definition for national security threat, which admittedly is difficult to define as the Supreme Court has already ruled in precedent. This, and they just decided to say, hey, well, we defined it for the purposes of the CSIS Act, so let's just take that, drop it in, and it'll be good enough. Turns got a, out. I got a, something here that I don't know if we can deal with this or not. Oh, anti-money also, laundering. Amen. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Put, post this on the screen right now from Isis Wise at Libs for Canada. The Morning Beaver discussed the border blockades. She is watching the show. Why was there never any mention of the MAGA pundits involved in amplifying and fundraising for the con- convoy? Jack uh, Posobiec celebrates the border blockades. The goal was to disrupt supply chains to reflect badly on Biden and Trudeau. And, and look, here he is celebrating it. Uh, all blockades are still holding strong. Coots, Emerson, Ambassador Bridge, and the occupation of Ottawa. Down at the Emerson border crossing, protesters are still blocking the flow of traffic between Canada and the U.S. You love to see it. Uh, Social media and fundraising orchestrated by Jack Posobiec. Here's his new profile pretty much declaring as much that, you know, uh, like it's it's a really good question. Was that dealt with in in that ruling? And I I don't know that it can be because they're foreigners, right? Mm -hmm. So... uh, he does in the ruling they talk about social media and how it influenced and, and how it was a, a catalyst if you will but can can i don't think they can actually deal with foreigners influencing other than saying that it was influenced and funded largely by foreigners yeah but the only thing they can do is probably stop the flow of the money once it arrives on the side of the border yeah exactly from going to to its intended targets but they can't stop it from coming in unless we you know develop some type of treaty with the United States with regard to that. Yep. There's nothing illegal about supporting stupidity, but there's something illegal about supporting illegal activities. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Which was the case that was appeared to the judge didn't rule. It was just stupid and the stupid judge ruled that it was indeed a blockade that threatened people's security. And this is, um, 
a question from James about Charlie Angus and his uh, big oil. Uh, will yeah. there be a yeah? Will there be a Charlie Angus big oil bill deep dive soon? My guess, no. <laughs> After this process, I'm a little gun shy. <laughs> One side, I'm going to take take it up again. I haven't uh, had a chance to read all of it. Uh, I haven't. Yeah, me neither. Um, I, I know it's intent. It's overall intent. Um, it's, it, it seems to me that the intent is to provide false advertising, uh, about, you know, um, much in the way the cigarette companies were saying, you know, this won't harm your health. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's a law that says that it's that, but written in such a way that prohibits all advertising in any way, shape or form yeah it's probably unconstitutional but if it's yeah. you know saying like this hey look what we're doing with the tailing ponds isn't this great and they've only done it for 0.02 percent of the tailing ponds and mm -hmm. only have like like dedicating three million dollars a year towards it that will only like it's protect the another 0.01 percent then yeah that would probably be deemed as misleading and probably be deemed as, as illegal if that were to pass in that way um, I'll have to read the bill to really fully okay. understand it because yeah. right now I don't, but as I, what I understood was it's designed to charge those who, uh, make claims that are contrary to fact. That's, that's how I understood it. Yeah. Like this. Now I've, that's what I'm saying. That's the thing. But if the bill is written in such a way that's this when if you do a deep dive deep dive and you find out that the bill is set in such a way that says well all promotion of the activities is basically bad well then yeah that's too heavy-handed and that won't survive yeah. if, if if a regular citizen says i think oil is great i love it and he goes to jail for that now i'm i'm being ridiculous in what i'm saying but if if that is the wording of the bill well then that's going too far that's definitely going too far. So, and Charlie you're, Angus you're is stealing pretty, somebody's freedom of expression right there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're allowed to tell the truth about a product someone doesn't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? that's you know, there's so yeah. Uh, uh, let's just say if it becomes more of a big deal, I'd probably be be inclined to go and do it. Right now, it just looks like an NDP grandstanding bill. Yes, and I think it's going to die. So I'm, I'm, I don't think that there's going to be much, um, much behind it, considering that the federal government is essentially building a pipeline <laughs> to the West Coast. Uh, I don't think it's going to get much government or opposition support on this one. I really don't think so. Either. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to invest the time unless it becomes a thing. Let's just put it this way. But if it does, I will. Mm -hmm. I will. There you go. No, exactly. You can't fight climate denialism with denialism of expression. Like this. So, it, it, like I'm saying, it's it's probably it's probably more if it's focused strictly on truth in advertising. Mm -hmm. this, then you've got a case. If it's anything else, if it's just sort of, sort of a backdoor way to stop people from putting ads on TV in promotion of a project that's a product that someone doesn't like, then no, you, you can't have that. You just can't have that. <laughs> Kill a damn Charlie Angus, go too far, say it's not so. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to think, given how seasoned he is a politician, he knows how far he can go really legislatively. But that's the question is whether or not whether or not the legislation is is a serious piece of legislation or it's one that was written to get clicks, you know, and feed some red meat to the makes one wonder, right? The really left wing of the base, you know, people that says like we should stop all oil now stop the planet like this we, we can't do that we can't stop the planet gravity will you know, make things bad things happen so <laughs> but you know somewhere between like keep pumping it out of the ground until every last drop is gone mm -hmm. as fast as humanly possible and pump the, hit the brakes and don't pump another drop now there's probably some middle ground <laughs> I, got, I got a funny for you here, which I just saw, and I'm like, oh, this is really hilarious. From uh, Right Wing Shoots Left at Hilting Hockey on the Twitter. I'm going to put this on the screen and I'll read it out for you because it's really funny. And <laughs> this is in regards to the guy from BC who moved his family of eight to Russia because he didn't like how Trudeau was running the country. So he thought he'd have more freedom in Russia. 
right wing shoots left rights. Trudeau is a dictator, so I'm going to move to North Korea. <laughs> I actually have the, the little video clip here, and I was thinking whether or not I wanted to attack it today, but uh, there's been a... Uh, oh, from the woman on I'm, TikTok? Yeah, I have it. But I think I'm going to I'm I'm, I'm going to save it for Monday because okay. I've got two three stories in in the world of because this one has a um uh, a rainbow connection. Oh, okay. Well, it's to it. A Canadian family that has eight children that sold everything they had in Canada and moved to Russia. Yes. <laughs> so uh, and 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 there's been a there's been some uh, a lot of rainbow news in the last couple of days. So maybe on uh, Tuesday we'll have a today in gay <laughs> section. <laughs> and I'll put it in with that one because yeah, it is kind of delicious, but you know what? I'll just say that, you know, I think that um, if a lot of people truly do believe that we do live in a tyrannical dictatorship, I would very much invite them. I mean, these people exercise their constitutional mobility rights to emigrate to another country mm -hmm. to go find out for themselves. Yeah. And they did. And they really regret it. And whether or not they're going to get back home is one thing, or whether or not they're all going to get thrown in jail and be considered foreign agents or foreign spies because now they're criticizing Russia before they can get home. Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh, well. I, they F-A'd, now they're f like, I mean, there's part of me that does feel bad for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, know, you still have compassion for individuals who make really stupid well, decisions. And the kids didn't choose kids this. Kids had no say in that. Number one, kids had no say in it. But, like, you know that expression, I would never die for my beliefs because there's a chance I might be wrong? <laughs> 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 I, I, I've never I'm not foolish before, enough but... to know that to, I'm not foolish enough to be so certain that I'm right, that I'm willing to die for these beliefs. <laughs> so yeah, listen, they did the thing that we would want people to do. It was like, you know what? You don't think, you think this place is a dictatorship when it clearly is not. Don't try to ruin my country. Go to another country that you feel you'll be more comfortable in. They did. Yeah. They probably know now what a real dictatorship is compared to what they had. Uh, you know, if they're able somehow to resolve that, get their money and come back home and come back here and live a life as grateful Canadians rather as rather than as ingrates, come on home. Like I said, we don't care when you get there. We just care that you get there. So if you fucked around, found out, learned, come back and are ready to be a grateful Canadian, come home. I'll welcome you with open yes. arms. But uh, we are talking about Putin. Yeah. And he does need a lot of money right now, so I'm sure their money came in really handy. <laughs> and uh, if they're going to, it's not like you can uh, go to the press and really start criticizing the government there, especially if you're not a citizen. So they don't take, actual dictators don't take too kindly to be insulted on national TV or in the press. So um, yeah, whether or not they're able to get home or whether or not they'll do some time in a, Siberian jail before they get to come back home. Oh, well. <laughs> Ooh, oopsie. oopsie. This is where, like, I need that, that meme of a drag queen going, choices. <laughs> you made choices. But at least they made choices. As opposed to all the people that just whine and complain. So, you know, uh, I'll, you had you actually had the courage of your convictions. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give you that respect for that. Except you know, it's still a dumbass you're an move. Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll respect that you had the courage of your convictions and you followed your principles. They're bad principles and dumb convictions, and you're an idiot. And you put eight children in harm's way. So. Yeah. I have no sympathy for you. I have no empathy for you. I do have compassion. And they're three different things. Yeah. I have yeah. compassion. Oh, boy. Same thing with all the occupiers. No sympathy, no empathy. I had compassion for people who came to Ottawa, threw their lives away for nothing. 
especially those who sincerely believed in Biden. Those are the people that I feel the worst for. Do I have sympathy or empathy? No, but I have compassion for you. They got played so yes. hard. That's the worst of it. The people who got played, the people who came to my neighborhood in Canada's capital and said, Ottawa belongs to the country. I'm like, no, Parliament Hill does. Ottawa belongs to the citizens who live, eat, sleep, work, breathe, pay taxes, and die here. Ottawa belongs to me and my neighbors. Parliament Hill belongs to the citizens of Canada. There's a distinction there that seems to be forgotten all the time. Mm -hmm. The parliamentary precinct, which is uh, policed by the RCMP and Parliament Protection Services, is Canadian. That's 100% Canadian sovereign soil. The city of Ottawa, that's a different story. Yeah. If you don't live here and pay taxes here or work here, you can't say that this part of the country belongs to you. Parliament Hill does. The parliamentary precinct does. But not the entire city. Not my neighborhood, not center town, not the one you came in and moved into for three weeks and defecated in my streets and harassed citizens and, and committed psyops on us by honking your horns for all hours, having disco dance parties at the end of my street, thinking that that was okay. Having, having a discotheque basically set up next to the most expensive real estate in the city. They're like, well, nobody lives there. That's a hotel. Yeah, there's people in the hotel. They, they have guests that come and go. And right next to the hotel is the most expensive real estate in Ottawa. A condo building, 700 Sussex. I think it's 700 Sussex. What is it? Maybe it's, I can't remember. It, it, the old former daily building right at the corner of oh, Sussex yes. and Rideau. Yeah, oh, yes, 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 yes. It's yes. the most expensive real estate in the city. It is. It is. And they had, yeah. they had a dance party set up right there. So when they say they weren't harming residents, bullshit. You were. I know. I live here. I live through it. Seven, 700 Sussex. 700 Sussex. Right? Sussex. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead and look it up online right. if you want. You can see it's, it ain't cheap. It ain't cheap. And they don't actually own it. It's a 100 year lease. That's right. Yeah. Then it reverts back to the NCC after that. All right, kids and cubs. That's the end of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because uh, we love making this for you. Trust me, this one was a real labor of love because at one point I really did want to quit <laughs> when I was doing the thread. So, oh my God, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> I just want to be finished. I had no idea that re reading illegal decision beginning to end and reading it beginning to end would have been shorter than commenting and on, on real time because I was clipping things and you know, writing stuff and tweeting and sometimes got the numbers wrong and then had to delete them and put the numbers back in order <laughs> and stuff. Um, but it was a very rewarding experience in terms that I learned a lot oh, no, and gained a lot of appreciation for the law, for the work that lawyers do, for the work that the Canadian Civil Liberties Association does, the Canadian Constitutional Foundation, uh, for all the things that a judge must consider, all the very complex nuances that must come in. Um, these people work hard. Mm -hmm. They do. These people work hard and these people are not dummies. They put the time and the effort and the hours in, for sure. Yeah. And all of this to make sure that we have a functioning democracy mm -hmm. that ensures that our rights are being upheld, even in situations where government needs to declare an emergencies act, that first and foremost, our rights are being upheld and respected. You know, so I, I have to, you know, lift my hat and respect to all involved, except the applicants that uh, showed up to lie grandstand and sort to insult yeah. the court's time. And let's remember, because I've said, said this on this show many times, and I'll say it forever, even those I do not like that work on Parliament Hill, and there are a number of them, they do put in the time. Oh, they work yes. insane hours. They really do. And that, that includes not just the members of Parliament, not just the MPs, but their entire staff. Oh, yeah. As, as a case in point, a friend of mine who used to work for, directly for uh, a prime minister at one point in time, says, 
says to me, he decided that he was leaving his position because he said, you know, I rolled out of bed at 5 a.m. on a Sunday for a 6 a.m. meeting I had to be at on the hill. He says, my feet hit the floor and I thought to myself, I hate my life. And he basically resigned a few days later because he just said, I couldn't do it anymore. I was working 20 hours a day. That's what happened when I was working PR. Mm -hmm. I loved PR, but I had no life. I was at the mercy of everyone's crises. After seven years of it, it was like, you know what? That's a young person's job. Or someone that has a real passion for it. But it's like, I want to play curling. I want to be in a play. I want to have a relationship. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to go to a birthday party, not have to pick up a phone and cancel at the last minute all the time. All the time. I stopped getting invited to stuff because it's all, well, I invite Douglas. He always calls and cancels. Mm -hmm. Because there's always something, mm-hmm. like, always something comes up. And I stopped getting it. I was losing my friends. Yes, because they just get tired of hearing no all the time. And remember this, because I've said this before and I'll say it again. The other thing to consider is those who have the drive to pursue those goals are incredibly focused individuals who have no lives. And by the way, if they have a spouse or they have children, their relationship is in peril at all times because they never see their spouse and they don't get to see their children grow up. And that's not a lie. That's true because I know people who have been in that position and, and after a number of years just said, that's it, I'm out. I can't do this anymore. So, you know, some people are megalomaniacs and some people uh, like to have their ego stroked on a daily basis, which is why I think Pierre Polyev is still there after 20 years and ultimately wants to become a dictator in chief because he won't be a prime minister. He will throw democracy out the window and destroy everything that we've built up over the last 160 years. But there's still focus, there's still ambition, there's still drive. And and I got to take my hat off to that. Even if it is misguided and dangerous to democracy, I will respect... uh, I will respect the game. Yeah. Got Christian going, I've ruined five relationships with my service. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It, that's, that's what it boils down to, right? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so we hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember sharing is caring. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Uh, if you would like to support us, you can, thanks to the Ray girl. Please go to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And that will take you to our pod page, like I mentioned. And when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, we'll come directly to you. If you'd like to support us in other ways, please make like Kit Elaine and go to our YouTube page, True North Eager Beaver Media, and click like, share, and subscribe there. We're getting close to the 700 subscribers. Oh, somebody's got the QR code. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, We really appreciate it uh, when you do that. And uh, also, if you'd like to support us in another way, uh, please go to the Emergency Hydration Fund here at the Beaver Lodge. And I hope that Jen is still with us, so because I think yesterday she may have missed it Mm. to keep us moist. I'm Batman. (laughs) There was three hours worth of us in there. <laughs> oh, another scan of the QR code. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, please make a, a donation there if you can. We really appreciate it. If you would like to write to us, our email address is truenortheagerbeaver at gmail.com. And uh, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, some stars and a review would be very, very appreciated because uh, that helps us. Uh, somehow get discovered i guess you get more activity or something mm-hmm. or more promotion the more that kind of happens yeah so and apple podcast uh, is a really big uh, platform so the, the, the more you rate yep. the better it improves it's it's strange how it all works with ratings i don't understand yeah it. i really don't but the more you do it apparently the better it yes is, so. Yeah. so thank you for so that. if you have some time to do that we uh, we really really appreciate that let's see what else do we have for you uh, because democracy is something that you do. Uh, do take some time to write your MPs, your MLAs, your senators, the members of the media, for whatever cause that's dear to your heart. Uh, if something really, really, really matters, ask for a meeting. So you want to meet in person, ask for uh, their time. 
Uh, it's really important. Handwritten letters always work best. Mm -hmm. And remember, when you're writing to your MPs or your MLAs or your MPPs, you don't need a stamp. Exactly. Right. It's free. Just drop it in the so mail and send it along. Let them know what you think. Let them know what's important to you. Mm -hmm. uh, an early happy birthday to Miss Shadika. That's correct, yes. Birthday on the Sunday, weekend. I believe. Yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Shadika or Miss Sadeka, because I know you like both. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> and many more. Stay with us for a long, 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 long time. Uh, all right. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there. So please, 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 please be kind to and gentle with yourself and have a wonderful and beautiful weekend. If you're a curling fan, remember the Scotty start this weekend. Yay, Jennifer Jones, last go at it. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? I have a few. Uh, oddly enough, I have thoughts. Words of wisdom? <laughs> I have a few. <laughs> Rem remember, and, and this is very important, democracy is always in a fragile state. It always is, because there are people in our own country and in our own parliament who wish to disrupt it. There are influencers from outside the country who are doing their darndest to disrupt it. So democracy is something that you do, and it needs to be protected at all costs. We went to wars over this. So do your part. Do your bit. If you can get involved and run for office at, at a school board, as a school board trustee, that's how you get your foot in the door because that's how the right-wing Christian nationalists are doing it, trying to take over our government and rob us of our democracy and strip you of your rights and kill all social programs. I'm not making this up. It's their stated goal. Mm -hmm. And they are doing it little by little. It's the playbook. It is the playbook. So if you can get involved, if and getting involved could be as little as, as writing your MPP, your MLA, your MP, writing your city councillor. That's involvement. If you can spread our message by sharing this program with as many people as you can, because our whole point is, is, is bringing the truth to you. And I put, some, I put it in the link earlier, uh, factcheck.io. Yes. Uh, we're going to promote that because it's, it's, uh, yes. it's a good thing. Yeah. I, I don't know if I still have it here. Let me just see. No, I don't. Yeah, uh, I don't. If you, uh, I think it was Dean's episode yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. yeah, he was talking about factcheck.io. Uh, please go to it uh, if you have an opportunity. It's, it's a fact-checking service. It's a, it, it's new on the scene in Canada, so it needs some uh, needs uh, to grow. But it uh, it it has some uh, AI components to it, whatnot. But it it does a lot of stuff. It it, it lets you know a lot about statements, where they come from, where they originated, um, you know, how they may have gotten torqued along the way. And uh, just, yeah, it really, really, really helps um, with uh, you being able to keep it clear uh, as to what things actually are. And uh, we'll probably have more involvement with them over the course, so we'll have a chance to get to know them. But uh, yeah, they're a new kid on the block. All right. All the words of wisdom have been uh, said. So it'll be time to roll the credits. And uh, Kid James, just a little message from us to you, uh, or from me to you. I know that we spar every now and then, there, there, uh, but you know I love you. And you have some wonderful family time coming. I hope that you enjoy it thoroughly, because what the world needs more of is some good and engaged dads, and you are one. So, Mr. Grizzly, roll them credits. I, uh, I will be happy to do that for you, sir. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, 
and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. I do not have an Easter egg for you because I feel I've talked enough. But Mr. Grizzly, if you got something, I didn't. I didn't expect that. That was that was a bit of a shock to me. I did not see that coming. But I do. I do have something loaded up here that I can show you, and and we'll scroll through it. This is um, this is Beaver's tire. Yeah, well, this, this is from uh, Alex Ruff, and and this is cute. Oh. Bill C-377 will formalize the process for members to request a security clearance, improving Parliament's ability to take national security issues seriously, while facilitating Parliament's ability to not only hold the government to account, but increase Canadians' trust in our democratic processes. And then he's got some videos here, blah, blah. And the first response, no. If Polyev wants high-level details, he can get his own security clearance. By the way, Alex, Polyev is going to throw you clear under the Conservative bus if this thing blows up. You know that, right? We know he's behind it, but he'll never lose his credibility over it. But you will. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, one, that man is lying through his teeth right mm -hmm. there because his statement implies that there isn't already a formalized process. It is extremely formal. Mm -hmm. Again, that purpose of that bill, a lot of people are saying that purpose of that bill is for that so that PP can get security clearance without having to go through it. No, no. You still need to qualify for your security clearance. It changes nothing with that. It just makes it so that once you have it, any time you apply to get some information, the need to know test, which is usually applied by our security apparatus, national intelligence apparatus, no longer gets applied. By virtue of the fact you apply for the information, you are deemed to need to know. So in other words, the determination of who needs to know moves from CSIS to the actual person applying. So it basically makes it so that I want to know, therefore I need to know, which is not good. It basically makes everyone who gets a security clearance that is of the level for the information that they are seeking, ENSACOP. Mm -hmm. ENSACOP is limited for a very, 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 very specific reason. And somebody pointed out to me today, because this is something I did not know, but a lot of people did not know that Alex Ruff was part of INSACOP. Interesting. Which makes, th which makes this particularly odious coming from him. But in addition to being on INSACOP, going to his Wikipedia page, he is a retired colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces. Dude! What the? You want to talk about proper use of WTF? Mm -hmm. Not where's the there funds? Oh, by the way, they had T-shirts printed. Did you see that? Yes, and some and that, see, I could have used that for the Easter egg. I didn't think of that, but people are, are starting to put like double what WTF means. Mm -hmm. So I was like, why is Trudeau so fantastic? <laughs> and somebody said, well, name this business because it's Anna's shirts, mm -hmm. right? So WTF, mine was wedded to fuckwad. <laughs> I have one more, one more thing to show you. This is interesting. Uh, this is uh, this is really interesting. Ben Shapiro posted many anti-Trudeau posts and podcasts during the convoy. He directed his millions of followers to donate to the Gifts and Go. Polyev takes Shapiro hashtag Shapiro on his YouTube vids videos. Coincidence? MGTOW, MGTOW, MGTOW. <laughs> Yeah. Shapiro, Shapiro. Um, yep. All right, kids. That's way too much information for one day. Go off and have a lovely weekend. And have yourself a breakfast <laughs> you if you're up for it. <laughs> and for those of you who are going to be celebrating Family Day and have the day off on Monday, enjoy the long weekend. Yeah, I'll be working. I'll be working. Yeah, so. Yep. So will I. We'll see you Monday. <laughs>